Hey everyone, welcome to part two of our Pirates episode. Since we mentioned before, we went on a little long, so we split it up for your convenience. <laughs> a, a little, a lot long, and yeah, we're splitting it up, so this is part two. We're going to talk about uh, the rest of this, that way you're not sitting there listening to a five-hour podcast. But yeah, this is part two. Let's go. Pirates of the Caribbean, At World's End. At World's End. The third movie. What do we got, Caroline? Why is this the Infinity War slash Ed game of the Pirates franchise? So this was intended to be the last film of the franchise. And it shows. It Oh, it shows. It because shows. A, a lot of things happen in this movie. It yeah, picks... you thought, again, this is going to get more complicated as we go along. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but... In the so this movie takes up almost a little bit after uh, the second movie, but definitely still attached because now Beckett controls the ocean because he controls Davy Jones and he's using Davy Jones to go on this like pirate murdering spree to destroy all pirate ships, and so he because of this now the nine pirate lords are going to convene at Shipwreck Cove because they need to, like, talk about how to handle Davy Jones. And also, because Captain Jack Sparrow never named... Captain Jack Sparrow, which we all now realize, he is the pirate lord of the Caribbean Sea. And they need him. They need him. He never named a successor. And so what they need to do now is they need to go and rescue... Captain Jack Sparrow from Davy Jones's locker, and to do that, they need the help of Barbosa, who apparently did. Was it? Is it kind of hinted that he himself escaped Davy Jones' locker, and that's why they need him? Because you know, we... I don't remember how they explained it in the movie, but from my like quick recaps and rewatches and stuff, they're saying that it was Tia Dalma that was the one that was able to get him back okay because do they hint to that at all i know tia dom was capable i just think like that, that but... by her saying like oh barbosa's gonna guide you meaning yeah. he's been there before i that's good enough for me yeah that means he's been in david jones locker and he's returned exactly so that's what i'm kind of getting from this but yeah so tia dalma tells them like we have to get like hit Barbosa is going to show you how to get into Davy Jones' locker so you can rescue him. But to get to Davy Jones' locker, you have to go through the South China Sea. And so because Captain Xiao Fang, who is the pirate lord of the South China Sea, he has the navigational charts that can get you to the locker. So now they have to sail to Singapore. And Will makes a promise to give jack to xiao fang in return for the pearl because he's gonna use the pearl to rescue his dad from the dutchman like he's making these will is falling into line as a pirate and starts making these underhanded deals but it's kind of not really known if he's gonna really follow through or if he's just saying this to get xiao fang on their side now he's becoming a pirate more and he's, more yeah he is what's interesting is the way that they designed the the film team the way that they designed davy jones's locker i watched the behind the scenes for this and how they came to design it and they said what would a pirate hell look like and the way that they did it was they thought of no discernible landmarks there's not even a real sun like the sunbeams and everything it's just kind of a flat very pale um undistinguishable area there's not even like hills there's there's just like like, there's some dunes of sand, but it's the furthest thing from water, which is sand. And it's just this dry uh, place. And then there's a boat, because then that means the boat can go nowhere. And so that's what yeah. a pirate hell looks like. It's the furthest, the furthest thing from the sea. And that's, like, where you're doomed to be. Is And, and the funny thing is, at the beginning, in um, one of the things that I wrote down... Oh, I hope it's still here... In the first movie, Jack has this quote where he talks about like, oh, when he and Elizabeth are stranded on the island 
And he says something like, oh, because she says, like, you'll be the greatest pirate in the Spanish main. And he says, not just the Spanish main, the entire ocean, like the entire world. Yeah. Yeah, wherever we, that. He's like, wherever we want to go, we go. And that's what a ship is. It's not a keel, a hull, a deck and sails. That's what a ship needs. But what a ship is, what the, like, what the Black Pearl is, is freedom. Freedom. And that's what Jack wants. In like, Sea of Thieves, they call it the freedom... Uh, what do they call it? Freedom something. But yeah, it's a <laughs> reference to that. Yeah, and it's just, that's what Jack wants the most in life, is to just be on his ship with the freedom to sail wherever he wants to go. That's his greatest desire, like, in life. And that's, I think, the true desire of a pirate, is the love for the sea and sailing and setting a course destination for wherever you want to go. Also, and so, to add to that, in the last uh -huh. movie, when Elizabeth meets up with Jack after he he recruited all the souls and, and also Norrington was there, he doesn't know that she showed up yet, so she walks up behind them and she says, Captain Jack Sparrow, I'm here. I'm I'm here for my love or whatever he whatever she says. And then he's like, oh, I'm sorry, dear. My one and only love is the sea. Yeah. <laughs> he's a true, true pirate. But yeah, he I, I love that you brought that up because I never consider that it's true. And I'm even I wanted to quickly look up the scene of Davy Jones Locker. And yeah, it's just an endless flat sand desert not even a desert just a and it's like it looks like an endless beach with no hills nothing no water is just i love that idea that yeah they can't sail anywhere there's nowhere to go you and can't look to the stars to guide you anywhere there's no constellation it's just it never becomes endless. night either yeah. it's just endless like bright because there's not even a sun that you could you know point like oh that's east like there's nothing there's no way to and that's smart that's yeah really there's smart i like there's that. there's no way to differentiate where your north and your south is and any of that and so that's what davy jones's locker is that's what pirate hell is and it's so like that was like something that i was absolutely blown away by was how much consideration they took into that was what what would a pirate hell be like yeah and it's away from the sea, no away treasure, from the, no trees, no, no navigation, water. because even yeah. like, I know I'm going to bring up Moana for, for not the last make time, way, make way. <laughs> but like when, when Maui is teaching Moana how to sail, like using the stars and stuff, I thought mm. of like, that's probably how pirates do it when they sail at night. You know, they're like, oh, there's that oh, constellation. Definitely. That means we they're going that from this Barbosa. way. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, yeah, we he even, says that's what he knows. We learned that from Sea of Thieves when we had to do the Constellation Tall Tale. I mean, Sea of Thieves, again. Again, a uh, love letter oh, to Pirates. Love letter to Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah. But yeah, like, there's, there's nothing discernible in this that a pirate, that makes a pirate a pirate. It's take everything you know about pirates and take it away. What's the opposite? And that's where they've stuck Jack Sparrow in. And what's so interesting is how Jack Sparrow goes a little mad. <laughs> in this beginning of the movie he's going a little crazy oh with definitely his jar of dirt and running around but yeah eventually he does get saved 30 jack sparrows 30 jack sparrows pointing at each other he's going crazy it felt like this is probably where they got interpretate like they probably got uh I'm trying to think of like the idea of all of those trippy scenes in Marvel. Cause that's what I felt like in this, when we had all those trippy scenes where Jack was going crazy. I felt like I was in a, Oh really? <laughs> like a quantum realm, uh, Dr. Doctor Strange, Strange mind, yeah. uh, rip. Or it's just like, Whoa. But the good news is eventually will and the crew are able to rescue him. And it's so cool, too, the way they have to flip the boat. <laughs> oh, I love that scene. I don't remember it as clear, so do you? <laughs> Can you explain? So this is how they... This is after they found them, right? And then they, they all get on the Black Pearl. I don't remember how they find water, but they find water, but they're still stranded. There's really nowhere to go. 
And then what do they have? Is it a map or something that's telling them? Something's giving them a hint. And Captain Jack Sparrow, he's the one that figures it out first. And then he does a classic not tell anyone what he found out. He just starts running from one side, then the other side, then yeah. back to the other side, then the other side. And then they're like, what are you doing? And then I think Gibbs catches on first or somebody catches on. They're like, just follow along. And then they all running one side, other side. One yeah, side. They, have, they have to tip the boat. <laughs> yeah, they're rocking the boat, rocking the boat a little bit more each time. It's getting higher, higher until whoop, completely flips over upside down. And then that gets them out of Davy Jones' locker. <laughs> they flip over to the, the realm of the, the real living. Life. Yeah, the living. Yeah. And, and I love the way it looks. It, it was, it was done so well. Like, yeah, I, the way we're not we're saying it is just not doing it justice. This is the part where I urge our listeners, if you get the chance, you know, watch all these movies, obviously. But this scene is so cool because the way that they do it and the way they show the water like twisting, and then all of a sudden it's just boop. They're they're right side up. They're back in the world of the living. It's like we got them. Yeah, we got them really... out. You know, they don't rush this. They really give it time to appreciate what they're doing. You know, the yeah. walking of the boat, running back and forth, back and forth. And then as it's tipping over higher and higher on each side, they have to hang on to make sure they don't fall off on the other side because it's getting almost vertical with how high it's rocking back and forth until it finally does flip. And then everyone is, if I remember correctly, they're all there just like holding their breath and they're they're thinking... I hope this works. Everyone is just hanging on. And then, yeah, it just like pops back up and boom, world of the living again. Yeah. So where they move on from there now is, uh, oh, that's also where Elizabeth finds out that her father died. And I, yeah, like, I that's remember, a beautiful scene. I don't remember, like, because I don't think I saw this movie in theaters. I think I rented this one. Um, because after the second movie, my parents didn't really like Cannibal Island. So they were like, Meh. so the third movie I had to rent, I had to wait a while to see, but I did not remember that Governor Swan died. I was like, <gasps> so when I watched it with y'all, I was like, oh my goodness, that's how he died. It's so like beautiful, but so sad because, um, there's a scene where they're leaving uh, the locker and they're seeing all the souls that haven't been ushered to the like like from the world of the living to the world of the dead because davy jones isn't doing his job so they're all just kind of in dinghies with little they're on pe- all little rowboats with lanterns and it looks so beautiful as they're all just sailing down you say beautiful i say heartbreaking because they have nowhere at to the same go time. is that the same time i mean it's a it's a beautiful scene but it also tells you oh all these people are dead yeah yeah and that's where they're passing by all these people and these are people that um because i'm trying to remember how did uh how did beckett like he just started killing people right and then one of the people was governor swan did they show it i thought it was off screen i thought that's the first time it's off screen but you see like some sailors from the ship there too and then it one of them is that is uh, governor swan and that's where elizabeth is like father what are you doing here and like nobody is kind of willing to tell her yet that her dad being there means he's dead yeah and she kind of starts putting it together at like at the same time and then he starts giving her his parting words and it's just so uh like so sad and it's such a from a narrative perspective, it was such a great way to tell the audience that he died. They didn't show us him being murdered. They just show like he and Beckett having a disagreement. And then the next time we see him, he's on this boat leaving the world of the living. And you see Kira Knightley's performance is so good. Everybody's performance is great. But to see that raw emotion come out of like elizabeth swan i wasn't looking at kira knightley anymore like obviously this whole time but like i was looking at elizabeth swan 
mourning the and, daughter who lost the father. Yeah, exactly. And that's such a raw moment, smack in the middle of a Pirates of the Caribbean film. And it's so good. It was handled so good. And it's a moment where the movie takes its time because that's just something we touched upon too is the movie has moments where it's really fast paced. All of these, like all the franchise has moments where it's fast paced and it has this awesome action choreography and epic sailing boat fights and, and soundtracks like a bum bum. But then it, there's also moments where they're not afraid to slow down and to hold on these really emotional scenes. And that was like one of the scenes when they were leaving the locker and they just give time for Elizabeth and her father to have these parting words and even her throwing rope so he could grab it and come aboard the ship and and then every like i think it's will that like finally pulls her away and like tries to console her because she's still like in denial of her father being dead yeah it's just like like he can it, do it yeah it's just uh like something that i didn't expect to be in a pirates movie but it just shows how much these stories they like the movies take itself seriously and how much dedicated they were to being films that weren't going to hold back from anything including heartfelt moments that's what i like these movies for because i wouldn't say you know once it gets to the action they they stick with the action and they deliver on the action but i think is always really it has a slower pace i really do think all of these movies are really stretched out to describe what what their goal is what everyone's own motivation is to do what they're doing and yeah like they set up the lore they sell up they set up why they're going to these islands why they're after these treasures who's seeking revenge on who who's out to kill who so yeah there's a lot of payoffs like this like that that scene of the dead sailing on these rowboats with just lanterns and that was a beautiful scene very yeah. sad but just the way the way you find out and just the way it looks in general, just like these lanterns lighting up to see like this dark sea. And what's interesting is that these movies, they're not like three hour epics like Lord of the Rings. There are like they're like two. I think the two longest and a half hour epics. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think they're I think at most they're two hours and 45 minutes. So they're pushing it. But that does show that they weren't because there was a lot of movies that um they like, oh, we have to be like an hour and a half. We have to be like this much because then we're going to keep people in their seats too long. And when Lord of the Rings did the three hours, uh, even the film like direct, like not Peter Jackson, but Peter Jackson had to really persuade uh, the executives to like let him make these movies three hours because they thought like, oh, my God, like nobody's going to sit for these films. And yeah. so for a Disney movie to be more than two hours, that's very impressive. And it, it definitely worked in their favor because that meant that they were able to put in everything they wanted to put in from the emotion to the action to, you know, just everything. And it so works for these movies. They don't outstay their welcome. There's not a moment where you sit there because like for me, I've had movies where I've sat there and I've thought this movie's going on for too long. Like I want to pause it and go do something else and come back to it. Maybe like for me, Man of Steel was one of those. And even like uh, I'm trying to think of another one, but like that's just like the, the first movie. Yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> just, but like no, it was. But like th there are movies that you just feel like this movie is going on too long, and I'm not interested enough in this movie to like warrant staying here for another 30, 45 minutes. Well, but I'll be honest, the pirates movies and even the Lord of the Rings, you feel their length. They're very long, but I enjoy I gonna, them. I was gonna say that opposite for me i never for lord of the rings and for pirates were you able to rewatch them even before this podcast i was busy <laughs> no but they're very long they're not like like i, watched I was the even first thinking right, i gotta settle in for almost three hours no i was able to like sit down and i didn't even feel the length when i watched the first movie this week i put it on and i was focused i was taking notes and then the next thing i knew like davy came home I was like, hey, I'm here. And I'm like, oh, I'm still watching Pirates. Like, I didn't feel it at all. I when love I'm... the pacing of all these movies. And I like how they're, they, I feel like 
again, they all just take their time to explain what's going on. But yeah, I don't see it as a, a negative. They're just long. I, they just are really long. I, I feel like they could even be shows. I, I feel like I'm watching enough story to fill up a, a season of a show. And Definitely. I felt like that even for Lord of the Rings. I'm like, this is a very long movie. Like, <laughs> they've been walking with this giant tree for a very long time. It's in two you know? towers. I know. Uh, when, when it comes to movies like Lord of the Rings and, and um, Pirates of the Caribbean, for me, I get immersed in a movie to where I don't even think about the time. And there are movies, like I said, where I feel like, oh, hey, this I've been here too long. But when I'm engaged... I don't even think about the time of like how long I've been sitting there. And especially with something like pirates, it's just going from like one thing to another. And yes, we have our pauses, but like, it's just, it's a movie that captures the attention despite its runtime. And that's like something that I hold very dear to my heart when a movie does that. Yeah. I, again, I don't want to, it's long, but I'm not using that as a negative. Like I like, exactly how they made these films so going on from after they get out of davy jones's locker that's where they get to the living world and this is where the plot gets more and more messy and where our intrepid protagonists get separated yet again because now they go um like the pearl stops at an island for water and that's where um they get attacked by shao fang who's the the pirate the, the lord of the south chinese the South China Sea, who gave them the charts in the first place, and they're also attacked by Beckett. And so this is where everybody gets messy because then Jack gives Elizabeth to Xiao Fang, and he tells Xiao Fang, oh, this, like, this woman, she's really Calypso. And this is where we first hear the name Calypso, who is supposed to be this, like, sea goddess who is trapped in human form. And so... Then also Jack throws Will off of the ship. So Will goes to cuz then Will goes to be on the Dutchman, right? I'm trying to remember how that went down. But I know that the like Dutchman? I just know Jack throws Will off the ship and uh he sends Elizabeth with Shaofang. And then it's it's with Xiao Fang. That's where we hear the tale that Calypso is the one that Davy Jones was in love with, and that yeah. it's she was bound in human form because she was betrayed by Davy Jones. And this is also kind of that missing piece of the puzzle because in the first in the second movie we weren't told why Davy Jones put his heart in a locker, like just that it was you know we talked about something vague, a woman, mm -hmm. but. It was actually because Davy Jones betrayed her. He and the Brethren Court, since he was a pirate lord, he and the Brethren Court bound Calypso in a human form. And so he felt that since he betrayed the love of his life, he wasn't worthy of his heart and of being the Dutchman. So that's why he cut his own heart out and he hasn't fulfilled his Dutchman duties. Yeah, this is a movie where we find out the actual story the the real like story yeah. behind the story because now now we can also say calypso we find out to be is tia dalma tia dalma yes and yeah. she's the one that told the story the first time at the end of the second movie so she was leaving out a lot of details and i think she left it purposely left it up to everyone to assume that oh you know it's a woman, you know how men get with women when they're in love and, you know, what could happen if there's... Is that what happened in the second movie? I thought that happened in this movie. At, she described at the very end. Um, oh, no, she's just not at the very end. She described, like, yeah, near the middle about what happened, the story behind Davy Jones and why his heart is... why he locked up his heart. Yeah, I... So... But she yeah, didn't explain yeah. Calypso, obviously, because it's her. She didn't explain yeah, any it's of that betrayal Fang. stuff. I think Xiao yeah. Fang and Gibbs are the one that tell us more of the story of Calypso. And then I know that while Elizabeth is on Xiao Fang's ship, the ship 
gets attacked by the Dutchman. And Xiao Feng dies, and he names Elizabeth, who he believes is Calypso, his successor. So as pirate of his, like, crew. Yeah. And when Elizabeth and the crew are locked in the brig of the Dutchman, that's where she meets Bootstrap Bill. And this is where, because, like, Beckett is in charge of Davy Jones. So there are like English officers on the Dutchman. And one of those English officers is our boy Norrington. So he's back. He's back and he's in charge, sort of. Not really. It's Beckett. But yeah, he's back and he sees Elizabeth is taken prisoner and put in the brig. And so good guy Norrington frees Elizabeth and her crew from the Dutchman and sends them on like a little rowboat. But then he's killed by Bootstrap Bill. (sighs) Yeah, you wouldn't think. This is is one of the deaths that I'm still not okay with. I think it's very lazy. And and, uh, we talked up and down about how the writing is in this movie. It's so good. But this is the part that I do not understand because Bootstrap Bill kills him, but he's supposed to be like crazed or whatever. He was fine. He was becoming part of the ship. So how did he go from like being part of the ship to walking around and then plat kills Norrington? I'm like, Bruh. yeah, when he felt like they were trying to find a way to just have him die or get yeah. rid of his character. They're like, all right, you've used up you, you, you know, you've already used up your youthfulness. Be gone with you. And it's like, we've already lost uh, Governor Swan. And then to have like the next death of a major character that was a major character in the first two movies, just be like, plop, and then bye. I don't know. It just felt like a throwaway. Like, okay, we don't need you. Bye. It was definitely a throwaway with how they did it. It didn't even seem like a big deal when it happened. You know, like it wasn't a giant musical cue and... And then it, it didn't even make sense. No. That was just something that I'm not okay with. Justice for Norrington. I'm going to stand by this hashtag. Oh, here we go. For a, Justice for Norrington. Bring him back. Save him from Davy Jones' locker. Bring him back the same way you brought Barbosa. You can just ride him back in. No one's ever really gone style. Yeah. Uh, get this girl. Uh, Tia Dama. She can do it. <laughs> just get her to do it. Yeah. But, yeah, that's another thing I want to ask you. I know Barboza is a favorite, but it, but the way they brought him back, right? It's just like it felt very Sergeant Johnson. Like, hey, you're supposed to be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. He He's got a favorite. shot in the heart. <laughs> yeah, and he didn't make a deal with Davy Jones or anything. He just no, got he, he just he just died a pirate's life. And yeah, does uh, that imply that any just any pirate? It can come back from Davy Jones' locker? Or does that imply that every pirate that dies goes to Davy Jones' locker, no matter if you die on land or on sea? Because, you know, the whole point is that he's supposed to usher the souls who die at sea. Yeah, but I assume there was only pirates who died at sea because pirates chose a pirate life, you know, to be but... galleywags and... You know, traitors and blah blah blah, only out for themselves. That's not and the case. And they die cause... on sea. That's it. They go to Davy Jones' locker. But he's a pirate, but he wasn't at sea. He was on an island. And then that's it's not just pirates that have to be ushered. It's it's souls that die at sea because you know we oh, yeah, see like we already saw like right Governor right. Swan and like all of them. Yeah. So it's not just pirate souls. And then it's. Then Barbosa didn't die at sea, but it's implied he was in Davy Jones' locker. So these are just things where you're like, eh, pirate's life for me. Savvy. But yeah, Barbosa yeah. was definitely Johnson. They're like, we need to bring this guy back. Jeffrey Rush and his, his pirate People like dri- them. We're just bringing him back. His pirate drip was so good, they had to bring him back. I mean, t- look at his outfit. He's beautiful. Amazing. He levels up every movie. Every movie. He gets more and more curls. His drip just gets even more drippier. <laughs> Are you using that word a lot? Can you describe to the millennials uh, what the heck you're talking about? Drip is uh, having cool out a cool outfit. All right. Thank you. 
Tell everyone <laughs> I'm here to clear up the confusion. All right, go ahead. <laughs> Old man Tony. Hey, but we yeah. got millennial listeners. You know, they're not all from your generation. Millennial listeners and older. Are you implying that I am not a millennial? Go on. So Norrington is killed by Bootstrap Bill, <laughs> and the Pearl arrives at. Uh, so Elizabeth and her crew from the Dutchman like escape on this dinghy. Meanwhile, Jack uh, arrives at Shipwreck Cove. Um, how does Elizabeth get back on? This is where it's just kind of so much it happens. It gets messy. It gets messy because I'm thinking Elizabeth and her crew leave the Dutchman, but how do they get to Shipwreck Cove? And so. And then Will, where is Will? <laughs> I'm trying to remember where Will is because he's not at the Brethren Court, but at the he's Brethren. He's not there, no. No. So at the Brethren Court, this is where we get all, we get to see all the nine pirate lords and we see all of these different pirate lords from different regions and like Jack Sparrow is a pirate lord. He's the pirate lord of the Caribbean Sea. And now Elizabeth is technically the pirate lord of the South China Sea. And so that's where they're, Elizabeth is telling like the pirate lords that they need to declare war on Davy Jones. And they're all saying, well, only a pirate king can declare war. And this is also the first time we see Jack Sparrow's dad, who he is like the keeper of the code, the pirate code. Yeah, he has a pirate codex. Yeah. A huge, heavy book full of pirate code. He has a huge heavy book and he opens it and tells them that the only way a pirate king can be made is to declare a vote and then barbosa tells her like oh this is impossible because every pirate lord votes for themselves so it's a stalemate we haven't had a pirate king and then they like they're like you know what just move for it like call a pirate vote so everybody starts voting for themselves and then jack sparrow in a twist and nobody saw coming. Jack votes for Elizabeth Swan. So Elizabeth goes to be a pirate king. Yeah. And her first act as pirate king is to declare war on Davy Jones and to free Calypso. So I'm trying to remember how this events go down. Because I know that after this, they go and they meet up with... Davy Jones and it's Barbosa, Jack, and Elizabeth meeting Davy Jones, Will. Yeah, on and, the island, and, right? And, and Davy Jones. Davy Jones is standing, standing on. He's standing in a bucket of water because he right, can't yeah, touch land. Go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they they all meet, and then Elizabeth, as pirate king, she trades Will for Jack, and so because Will is there as like a a prisoner. And so she's like, I'll give you Jack if you give me Will. They say, okay, they trade. And then when they go aboard, so then they leave. Jack is with the Dutchman. And then uh, Will, Elizabeth, and Barbosa go back to the Pearl. And it's on the Pearl that they free Calypso. And then uh, Will reveals that it was Jones who imprisoned calypso in the first place and calypso is angry at everybody <laughs> and she's not there to help so calypso like tia dalma now transforms into calypso this giant like thing a giant tia dalma a, di a giant tia dalma who also turns into crabs and a huge storm happens and this is where the movie goes from great to awesome because then we get my favorite scene in the movie and that's this huge whirlpool going on all the while the epic most bestest movie theme song is playing and you see like davy jones and jack sparrow dueling on the top of a ship mass it's just so on the cool. sail yeah on the sail it's just like bam bam Bum, 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 ba -dum, as like swords clash it's so cool and there's then, uh, rain everywhere there's a whirlpool there's they're, ships they're sh shooting sailing cannons. around this whirlpool yeah they're going in circles yeah. shooting cannons at one another and then in this chaos will is like elizabeth swan <laughs> will you marry me and she's like barbosa like what and she's like marry us 
Barboza marries them. He he like pronounces war. Yeah, while they're fighting, like they're all locked in combat. He's like, Will you, Elizabeth Swantick, Will Turner to be ye husband? I do. <laughs> and will you, Will Turner, take Elizabeth Swan to be ye wife? I, I do. He's like, I pronounce ye husband and wife. You may kiss the bride. And it's like Bum, bum, bum. And it's like playing there. They have like a theme song that they have, but it's like such an awesome moment. Like that's not the way that they probably envision their wedding going down, but mm. it's the wedding of a pirate. It's they were so living cool. in the moment. They were living in the moment. 701 in a maelstrom, live in the moment. <laughs> and then my favorite scene happens. Like when I think about this movie, this scene is the first one that comes to mind. When they're oh. fighting Davy Jones after the marriage, but still in this whirlpool, heavy rain, sword fights, cannons, all that. And Captain Jack Sparrow is ready to stab Davy Jones' heart. He has it. He has it out of the chest. He's holding it in his hand. He's ready to stab it. Um, He's going to then... be the Dutchman. He's going to be able to sail forever, guiding yeah, the souls. Davy Jones to... To get a one up on him, he dabs and kills, quote unquote, Will Turner. Stabs him right in the heart. He's slowly dying. Elizabeth is crying over him. His dad gets up to fight Davy Jones because he's killing his son. He's about to die. Moments away from death. And then they make they make Will Turner's hand stab the heart so that Will Turner could become the captain of the Flying Dutchman and thus give him life to sail the seas as the captain. And that scene was amazing. It was smart. It was What a exciting. twist, too. Yeah. Oh, man. I always think about that scene. I, I can imagine it right now, just the way that they stab the heart and then it zooms out to show... Is like on the the deck of the ship, and it shows that they're holding his hand to stab the heart himself, so that he becomes the captain of the Flying Dutchman. I was imagining it as you were describing it because yeah. it's so iconic, and especially it's something that you're so used to seeing Jack Sparrow be this deutagonist of like he's not always good, he's not always bad, he's a pirate. And so to see him like actually do something nice for this guy that's, you know, Will's betrayed him too. They've done their good fair share of betraying each other. Mm -hmm. But there, I guess there's also like a friendliness between them. And um, so when he sees Will dying and Elizabeth saddened, he doesn't take it for himself. He gives that power to Will and has him stab the heart. It was such a good idea. And I didn't even think about it. But yeah, to give him life like that by stabbing the heart. Amazing. Then we get one of the coolest death scenes <laughs> after that, which is of where who? of of Beckett. That scene where um so then now that um Davy Jones is can now like he can die. Oh I, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know what he, to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, he can now die. And so the Dutchman like sinks and then comes back newly made. Because the Dutchman we had seen before was like dirty and rotten and corrupted because Davy Jones wasn't doing his yeah, job. It was like and algae all of the, and sea yeah, life and all and this coral nastiness like, all over the ship. Barnacles growing everywhere. Yeah. But now and even on the crew, all the crew was like monstrous and things like that but now yeah. that will turner is the captain of the dutchman it like resurfaces brand spanking new will has on these like cool dutchman duds not as cool as the first movie but still pretty cool and then he starts um attacking so then we get this scene where the pearl and the dutchman like pincer attack beckett's ship and it's just these two ships sandwiching like an oreo this middle ship and there's cannons flying everywhere and the scene like the camera holds on beckett as he's walking down these stairs and just all around him yeah. is destruction it was so cool like that scene even though you're like oh boy you did that's a beautiful scene <laughs> another beautiful death scene tony 
You don't think it's beautiful? I think it's cool. I don't know about beauty. It's cannonballs. Hundreds of cannonballs <laughs> being flown at this ship. And then just planks, wood, shrapnel flying everywhere. And in slow motion, Lord Becca is just walking down the stairs, accepting his fate, going down with the ship as a captain should. That I, I Watch that scene again. It was beautiful. <laughs> But it, it's definitely the coolest death scene in the movie, in all the movies to me. And he goes down with his ship. And this is where we see, like, the story has kind of come to its end. They've taken out their um, their threat. And this is where Will uh, and Elizabeth have to bid each other farewell because he has to go and depart on the Dutchman. So they spend their yeah. honeymoon having their one day on on shore and he leaves elizabeth it's heavily implied that she's pregnant and then he also leaves his chest with his own heart yeah with elizabeth so that's interesting too because that means he can't feel anything right i didn't think about that yeah until after they were implying that to be a bad thing early on with with uh davy jones like he cut out his heart so he could never feel again and yeah, get, and to, I him. know it's supposed to be a romantic gesture, but but yeah, I was thinking it also like, implies Will, he doesn't I, feel love anymore. Will, I don't know if you know what that means. <laughs> He's but like, he, I'm the captain of the Flying Dutchman. I got to tear my heart out now. I got to tear my heart out and give it to my wife. And she didn't think that was gross. <laughs> no, she was just like, oh, he's so sweet. a beating heart in a box by I mean, stand. basically, that's like saying you control me. So that does show immense trust in her. Miss Chaotic Neutral yeah. Elizabeth Swan. Yeah. Meanwhile, the only thing I don't like about this ending is that somehow Barbosa stole the pearl again. Somehow, Papa T returned. <laughs> I was hoping you would catch that. Somehow, Barbosa stole. Barbosa returns. Stole. <laughs> that's the ending of the second movie. Yeah. Somehow, Barbosa returns. That was in the script. They they uh they said that one. <laughs> We gotta get Oscar Isaac. They gave it a Bruckheimer. <laughs> Somehow. Somehow. All right, cool. He stamps it for approval. Yeah, he's happy about it. Not like yeah. Oscar Isaac just going. Somehow, Palpatine returned, <laughs> like exasperated. <laughs> but in this movie, it's like somehow Barbosa returned, and in the third movie, somehow Barbosa stole the pearl again. <laughs> but yep, Jack stole. Chow Fang's charts that don't just have the way to get into Davy Jones' locker, but also have the way to get to the Fountain of Youth. And setting up part four, but yeah, def- then it also shows Jack's, you know, uh, wittiness, and I mean, uh, not wittiness. Oh, uh, just like how he how can outsmart people. Yeah, and, and he like, always oh, kind of has the map, but he got the actual part that mattered. He always kind of has the last laugh kind of thing. Except when he died in the last one. But. Yeah, we don't talk about that because Elizabeth Swan did an underhanded move. Yeah. It's chaotic neutral. And then in the post credit scene, we do see 10 years later, Elizabeth now has a little boy named Henry. And they watch Will return up, like with the Dutchman as he approaches yeah. to finally set on shore again. And that actually sets up the fifth movie. So... I like that all these movies tie in together. It's like poetry. It rhymes. It's like how a franchise should be. Yeah, (laughs) it is. It's amazing that these five movies that are not based on any book all tie in. Cohesively. But this was what I was mentioning before and why I felt that this is really a Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan slash Turner movie. Or trilogy because it ties up their story you know captain jack sparrow he goes on these adventures but what's his overall arc throughout the movies you know i feel like he i feel like he's just a very strong side character that we love and he gets he gets a lot of screen time no doubt but yeah i feel like this ending like you just said earlier, it's it's the end of a trilogy because it's also the end of their story. 
well as, as we knew at the time. I mean, looking at it now, yeah, that would have been a satisfying ending, but I am grateful for the real ending we got. Yeah. So, is there anything you want to mention about At World's End before we move on to On Stranger Tides? At World's End. Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I think we were mentioning already while you were explaining the story. But yeah, it has a great finale. I love the huge, ginormous whirlpool and just the hurricane that's going on and the fighting. That was a it really did feel like this is our last one. You know, we're going to end it like this. And it felt like the grand finale. Yeah. Again, the, the Davy Jones scene, stabbing the heart. I like the, I forgot what it was called, but like the council of pirates, you know, of the, of the pirate Lords is again, is expanding the pirate history and makes it deeper than just them searching for gold all the time, even though that's really what they want. But it gives it more layers. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. But yeah, then it brings back Davy Jones. It, this kind of does compare to Infinity War Endgame a little bit because, you know, we're carrying over the same villain. Especially villains. with um, having one of our beloved characters dying. Yeah. And then in one film and then coming back in the next one. Exactly. And it is a little bit of a cliffhanger ending, if you do want to call it that. Because it has Davy Jones, it still has all the pirate things that we want to see. But that's why I was calling the second one like peak pirate because it has the crack in. It has yeah, it has a ship that submerges into the ocean and then just comes out of the you know the, with the flying Dutchman. But this one was a great finale. I agree. It was definitely something audiences were content. And even Orlando Bloom and Kira Knightley were content. They were like, okay, our stories are over. They felt like that was a, and, and a lot of people felt like this was a satisfying ending to the film. And you know, so, yeah, what's ahead. funny is like, oh, I, was, I was forgot too, the director, Gore Verbinski, uh, who directed the all like the first three movies yeah when it came to directing the fourth one he at first he was like no i can't i'm busy i'm directing these other films and then when he did become free he was like you know what no because i i don't he said the to me the only reason you're making the fourth movie is for money and i don't think that like i, I don't think i could do anything that would help with that so i'm not going to do <laughs> the fourth movie and he didn't come back for the fifth one either right it was a new director mm -hmm. Yeah, he didn't come back for the fifth one either. But I do think that Hans Zimmer still did the music for this one. And the writers, um, the screenplay writers for the first three movies did come back for the fourth movie. The only one that didn't come back was the director. Because even Bruckheimer came back. Like, he was the one that was like, hey, we're doing a fourth movie. And he was there for all of them. Bruckheimer, Bruckheimer oh yeah. Right? Oh yeah. Bruckheimer loves pirate movies. But yeah, uh, I was going to ask... Did they say anything about... Well, you mentioned it a little bit about what he thought about a fourth movie. But did you look up anything as to whether or not it was planned? Or they saw like, oh man, this is doing really good. We got to make another one. We got to find a story to continue this. So a little bit before the premiere of At World's End... Um, Jerry Bruckheimer said that it was going to be like the end of the trilogy, but he was still interested in making a spinoff. He wanted to do a spinoff that was not connected to the main story of um, the like of like the pirates of like Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan and all that. He wanted to do. He thought like, okay, our next movie is going to be like a just like a different pirate type of film. But I'm trying to remember like. He, so I think it was that in 2007, the writers, Ted Elliott and Terry Rossio, they started working on the possibility of a fourth movie. And it was when they showed this, this movie to Bruckheimer and said, Hey, you know what? We kind of have an idea for what we want to do for a fourth pirates movie. And he read it and he was all on board and he was like, okay, like, yeah, let's do it. And, uh, 
Somehow, that was, Captain Jack returns. Somehow, Captain Jack Sparrow returns. And this is where, like, Bruckheimer's, like, trying to get the band back together. But Verbinski was just kind of like, no, I'm out. Like, I don't think that I, like, could bring anything unique and new to this movie. I, I've already, like, used up all of my emotional... Uh, investment in the yeah franchise. investment by the first three so they got this guy called I rob marshall that. yeah yeah you i know? respect that i like that answer too i respect sometimes that. you just got to know when to end it you know and sometimes i think also if he was if he i think he himself kind of knew too like if i go in it's just to get a paycheck and if they're serious about this fourth movie that they don't deserve that from me and i feel like i've done all i can so yeah i'm i'm good like you can get somebody else who mm. is more like willing to take on this this job and so yeah uh marshall rob marshall is the director of this movie uh on stranger tides and he said that he he wanted it because he liked the idea of working with a new storyline and a new set of characters because he kind of wanted to make his own mark in film but also like knew that this was going to be kind of this was going to set the tone of direction for the next like pirate movies if this franchise was going to survive outside of just being a trilogy so he uh also like rob marshall said he was a huge fan of johnny depp and he wanted to work with him <laughs> more than just make the movie he wanted to meet johnny depp he wanted to meet captain jack sparrow <laughs> in real life now there what like this movie was not without its problems because um I think a little bit into um production. Let me see if it's this movie or the next movie. But one of the ones was that the is it on Stranger Tides? Yeah, it is. So a big reason that this movie took a long time to make also was the chairman of Walt Disney Studios. His name was Richard Cook and he resigned from his position and that left Johnny Depp kind of a little bit up in the air of if he was going to return as Captain Jack Sparrow because Johnny Depp felt that uh, Richard Cook was one of the Disney executives that stuck his neck out for him in the original trilogy with how he portrayed Jack Sparrow. And he said, like, when things went a little sideways on the first Pirates movies and the other studios were less enthusiastic about my interpretation of the character, Richard was always there backing me up and he trusted me. And so he felt that if, especially with now Jack Sparrow taking on this movie on his own, he wasn't going to have Will Turner or Elizabeth Swan next to him to play off of. He was going to be kind of the only person holding up this franchise. And he felt that if he wanted to interpret the character or portray the character in a different light and executives didn't like that, they were going to mingle and like kind of mess with the way that that happened. And that's what he didn't want. He didn't want anybody telling him how he should play Captain Jack Sparrow. And so that was kind of like his answer on whether he was going to be Jack Sparrow was what took the movie a long time to kind of come out with. And it wasn't until he felt more secure in his job position, because there's a lot of time that happened between 2006 and 2011. That's what, five years between the third movie and the fourth. Yeah. So, they I think it was like the way that they kind of secured it also was that they told um, it was either Bruckheimer or the new Disney Studios chairman. Like first they paid him fifty five point five million dollars for his role up front. That was a huge deal for an actor. And they told him that like, you know, we need you for this movie because without you for this movie, there is no movie. And so that was like made him like, okay, you know, I have a little bit of a job security. But yeah, another reason why that this movie took a long time was because they knew. And what got Bruckheimer from the start was when the screenwriters pitched to him, we're going to bring out Blackbeard. And yeah, he's the big baddie of this a movie. A classic pirate. A classic pirate like Davy Jones. Blackbeard. Yeah is part of pirate legend. And that was where Bruckheimer was like, oh, we got to make a movie now. Like, Blackbeard? We got to. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that they weren't able to get to 
to uh, Blackbeard yet within three movies. But they were so wrapped up in their tales, they probably thought that Blackbeard would be like a spinoff kind of thing. And in a yeah. way, it kind of works because, you know, I'm going to say this right off the bat on Stranger Tides to me is the weakest of the films, but that doesn't make it in and of itself a weak film. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can agree with that. And it wasn't until the last movie, Dead Man Tell No Tales, that part four felt like a side story. Yeah, it was like a little a su- odd one out. Yeah. I just want to mention, since we're jumping around, as soon as we see uh, Orlando Bloom again, I thought, dang, this connects. This is this is part four. This is it. This is a true. Yeah, this is, this part is a four. true sequel. This yeah. is a true sequel to the third movie. I agree. I, I completely was thinking, what agree. What did we just watch? Because that that felt. I didn't even like know. A side quest. That's another thing we should preface. Ep- um, episode. <laughs> I was gonna say movie four and five. I had not seen, so I experienced it for the first time this past weekend with you yeah. and we sat down and watched it because I hadn't seen these movies yet. For me, the last movie was the third movie and I never got around to seeing the fourth and the fifth. And so watching the fourth movie, yeah, it definitely feels like a spinoff. Jack Sparrow does not have his, you know, moral compasses. I feel like the angel and the devil on his shoulder, which are Will and Elizabeth, because Elizabeth is always sending him to do bad things and Will's always encouraging him to do good things. But um, like we, this is him on his own and we get a little bit of a deep dive into somebody from his past, which is this woman named Angelica, who is played by Penelope Cruz. And this movie centers around finding the fountain of youth, which was discovered by Ponce de Leon. And uh, we like find out that this woman, Angelica, is the daughter of of blackbeard who's the legendary pirate blackbeard he's ruthless he's um no nonsense he's the captain of the queen anne's revenge i love all these ship names and uh they're great oh yeah and so jack is also the captain of and he's like because the black pearl is in a bottle in this movie right yeah, in the library or the shelf of Blackbeard, you just find a whole bunch of other ships that I don't Blackbeard, know how he bottled. But... Yeah, well, it, it's implied that Blackbeard is into like magic, whether it be like voodoo oh, yeah. magic or like just sea magic that is unexplained magic, because his boat is magic. He can like take um, charge of the ropes. And not just of his own ship, but I think of any ship, because Barbosa, who also appears in this film, says that the Queen Anne's Revenge attacked the Black Pearl. And uh, he used, he said, like, to use my own ship's ropes to hold me against me will. Like, I, I chose to cut off my own, like, my own limb than to be held by him. And like Barbosa cuts off his leg, so yeah, now that's the Barbosa... part I missed. I missed when he was explaining that when they were tied up in the tree. I missed that he used the same rope trick on the Black Pearl, and like it caught his foot. Yeah, and that's why like Barbosa cut his off his own foot so he could escape the Black Pearl. So now Barbosa's walking around with the trademark pirate peg leg. Nobody he's had more a hook. A pirate in... than Captain Jack now. He's more pirate than Captain Jack. He's more pirate than men. Nobody in this movies have a hook. That's like a Captain Hook thing. Yeah, that's surprising. But uh, that's surprising. maybe it's because it's so childish and Captain Hook like that they're like, nah. We'll I think leave they could that have pulled to, it off. We'll leave that to Peter Pan. They could have done it. But um, but yeah, now Barbosa is now working for the King of England, and what is it, Jack? Because I remember in the plot, Jack meets his dad and his dad tells him like in this bar that um, like how to read the the map that takes you to the Fountain of Youth. And also that somebody in the town is impersonating Jack Sparrow trying to recruit a, a crew to go find the Fountain of Youth. And the person impersonating him is his old flame, Angelica. And yeah. 
Jack is a lover of the sea. His first love is the sea and the pearl and everything about being a pirate. It's freedom. But he's mentions in the movie that Angelica is the only woman who he's had what, stirrings. what word stirrings for. So this woman has a lot of sway in in his eyes. And he is somehow um Jack is like put on board the Queen Anne's Revenge where he sees that he at first he thinks Angelica is just pretending to be Blackbeard's daughter, but then no, in a twist, like Angelica is actually Blackbeard's daughter. And Blackbeard, there's a curse that one day he will meet his end to a pirate with one leg. And so Angelica doesn't want her dad to die like through this curse. She wants him to live forever or like to live beyond this curse. So she wants to get to the fountain of youth so that way she can help her dad and like heal her dad. But in order to get to the fountain of youth, you have to have two silver chalices that have to be retrieved from Ponce de Leon's flagship, the Santiago. And you also have to have a mermaid's tear. And what it is, is that it's these two chalices have to be filled up with water from the fountain of youth and you have to place the tear in one of them and they have to be drank at the same time to activate the fountain's healing properties. But the drinker who doesn't have the tear will die and give their life force to the one who does have the tear in their cup. And so um, that's how like now, so the movie kind of has you thinking that they're going to use Jack to drink from the cup with no tear. That way he can give his life force to Blackbeard, who's going to drink the cup with a tear. But now that sets them on this goal. First, they have to find the flagship of the Santiago and they have to find a mermaid and get her to cry. So then we get on this little shenanigans journey, as do pirates do. And they go to the flagship, and that is where Jack meets Barbosa because Barbosa is sent by the King of England. Because for some reason, Barbosa decided to go work for the King of England. It's like, Barbosa, what are you doing? And he is working for the King of England to bring in Blackbeard. But in reality, he's just using the King of England's resources because he wants revenge on Blackbeard. So they That's fight. That's his main motivator for this movie. Oh, Not yeah. even the Fountain of Youth. He just wants to kill Blackbeard. <laughs> and he wants the Black Pearl back. Yeah. So he... So Jack and Barbosa fight, but Jack gets the uh, the chalices and he takes them back to Blackbeard. And then they go to White Cat Bay. That's what it is. And also along the way, they have this Christian boy, Philip, <laughs> this little church boy. He's so sweet. And he's like, uh, yeah, he's like, he's the new Will Turner. In a way, yeah, he's the straight man. So yeah. he's like, the, he's the Boy Scout. He's this Christian boy and Angelica doesn't want to kill him because she thinks that like, first of all, like she wants to save Blackbeard's soul. And so she thinks that Philip can like evangelize to him and save his soul. But Blackbeard's like, nah, <laughs> and, but still doesn't kill him because he doesn't want to upset his daughter. But on this like way to capture a mermaid, the crew gets attacked by mermaids. Some of the crew on this boat. And when one of them gets pulled down. Everybody on the pier, because it's like a little, they're on a boat, but then there's also a pier. They also get attacked on the pier. But Philip is running and one of the mermaids kind of gets trapped with him on shore. And that's the mermaid they end up capturing and taking her to the supposed site of the Fountain of Youth. And along the way, Philip and his mermaid start getting a little cozy with one another. And he even gives her a name of Serena. So Serena the mermaid and him start making kind of goo-goo eyes at each other. And Blackbeard is like, I can use this. So he kind of emotionally manipulates the two of them to where he like drags Philip away at some point And that gets Serena to cry. Oh no, he brings him back. And that's when Philip tells Serena that he loves her, even though they just met. Yeah, but <laughs> knew each other for a day. A, a little bit less than that, but yeah, like a day. And Serena is so happy that she cries tears of joy. And Blackbeard is like, ah, and he, it was. Gotcha. In, grab the, the vial. <laughs> grab the vial. Her yep. And he grabs her tear. And then Philip is. And so he leaves Serena like tied up so she can die of dehydration. And it's like, dang. 
It's like half on land, half on sea. And that's the way to kill a mermaid. Yeah, straight up torture. Yep. So from here, I'm trying to remember. Because then it's when they go into this like cave. That's what it is. And in this cave, Jack is able to kind of like figure out that you go through the ceiling. And it's in the ceiling, there's like a fountain. And that's the fountain of youth. And it's in there that they're planning on, like, using Jack to be uh, Blackbeard's. I'm thinking of, like, Bloodbag from uh, Mad Max, but his life bag. <laughs> However, Barbosa's oh, there. Bag. However, Barbosa's there. And Barbosa's like, ha, I gotcha. And then not only that, but the Spanish... Like the Spanish Inquisition uh, people were also a thing at this time. And they want to destroy the fountain because they believe the fountain is an abomination against God. And so this huge fight ensues in the cave of the Fountain of Youth, where in this chaos, um, Barbosa stabs Blackbeard with a poisoned sword. And then just Angelica, who is shown to be this like, experienced pirate woman picks up the sword with her hand from she the holds blade, a blade from the with blade her bare hand and so she gets cut and poisoned and jack kind of tricks the two of them he tells them like you know one has the tear one doesn't so who's gonna save who and blackbeard is like you do anything for your father wouldn't you and takes the cup with the tear, like he's going to stay alive. And so Angelica is like, okay. And she, you could just tell like there is betrayal on her face, but you know, she kind of knew what she was signing up for. So she's resigned to it anyway. And she drinks the chalice, but it turns out Jack switched it on the two of them. And he gave Blackbeard the unmermaid chalice and gave angelica the, the mermaid chalice. yeah the, and gave angelica the tear chalice so blackbeard dies and gives angelica his life force so angelica stays alive meanwhile serena and philip they don't really go anywhere like in terms of characteristics she like like he, philip runs in the chaos he runs to rescue her and she kisses him and then takes him underwater <laughs> and we never see him again like literally we never see him again this is the first and last movie that we see him in. Exactly. And then Jack leaves Angelica on the island that he was left on in the first movie. Because while he does have stirrings for her, he also can't trust her. She's and crazy. then, yeah, she, she is crazy, but he likes that. And then after that, it's we get, we do get like a really cool ending though for. This movie, we quote it all the time since we've seen it. Where he's like, it's a pirate's life for me. Savvy. Savvy. Because, Roll credits. Yeah. In the midst of all this, Jack has stolen the bottle that the Black Pearl was trapped in, thanks to Blackbeard's magic. So he has the pearl in a way. And uh, Does he still have the pearl at the end of this movie? Yeah, he has the bottle. So they they use it in the next movie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Did I'm just trying to remember at which it was point like the they the ink they and shrink crack it, like it the... open and have the the ship yeah, that, just enlarge. That... Yeah, that's the last movie. But okay. in this one, he has it in a bottle and he leaves. I thought with Captain it. Barboza had it though for some reason. Nope. <laughs> okay. Because he usually almost always ends up with the black pearl. More Usually. often than Captain Jack Sparrow. Yeah, yeah. That is the sad part, is we don't get to see Jack Captain the Black Pearl a lot. But, yeah. yeah. But, um, but yeah. So, we get that really cool scene where he, he walks off into the sunset with Gibbs, and he's like, it's a pirate's life for me. Savvy. And then... Dun -dun 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 so, for this movie, Blackbeard is our main guy, our main villain for this movie. Mm -hmm. And I was just going to say that I think, although he doesn't stand out that much compared to like Captain Barboza or Davy Jones, I really do think he's the most ruthless. He kind of seems like the most cold hearted 
Definitely. We talked about how like Barbosa doesn't even feel like a real villain villain. He feels like just a pirate doing pirate things, but he can be a little more underhanded. And then Davy Jones, we talked about how he's like quirky and he's got that little like kind of thing about him and yeah. You know, well, he could be villainy though. He has his oh, yeah. crew enslaved on the Dutchman. Yeah, he's definitely more villainous in act, but in terms of like uh, like behavior, he's kind of like a oh. He's got kind of a little Scottish accent in there, light voice, but Blackbeard, yeah, definitely the most ruthless, the most like bloodthirsty too. Um he's not willing to just kill people. Like he's not um nothing stopping him from just killing someone he's like yeah okay kill him and he's yeah, like he the... gives all his character gives off the signal like you don't want to mess with this guy yeah from the moment you meet him because he walks out he already looks like someone you don't want to mess with and then he has his pirate magic or whatever it is he could take the the ropes of the sails and all the sh- and the entire ship Tangle everybody in its webs. That was a cool looking scene where all all the pirates were just captured and tangled in all the ropes. But yeah, he's just very capable, very powerful, doesn't care who he has to kill. And the one scene specifically is when he, I forgot who it is, but he's trying to, or he tricks somebody into thinking that they can escape. So they get on a rowboat and they start sailing away and then his ship has flamethrowers that just shoot out fire and he starts burning that that pirate on that little rowboat just completely to the crisp. When that Jack was a, Sparrow, that was like, a scene. Yeah, that's when like Jack Sparrow he believed that there was no Blackbeard, so he convinced the rest of the crew to like mutiny against what he believed was just Angelica telling people this was a Blackbeard ship. And then when Blackbeard actually came out, they were like, who's the first one that like started the mutiny? And it was just this like random guy. And yeah, he puts him on a little boat, lets him sail away. But then it wasn't Captain Jack Sparrow like, I hear there's a mutiny or yeah, know, yeah. He's, trying to <laughs> he's trying to pretend it wasn't him. Yeah. But yeah, definitely like a cruel cutthroat pirate is Blackbeard. So yeah, that I wanted to point out. And really, the whole reason to watch this movie and the highlight are the mermaids. And it's just one scene. But again, this they do their own tall tales of you know, what a mermaid is in the pirate world and how they lure pirates with their, their beautiful voice and, and songs that they sing. And they look beautiful themselves. So when they come up to to see them on their ships, some of these pirates, they, they want to go with them. They go with them into the ocean and then they're frightening creatures. Oh, yeah. They, they grow fangs. They, they attack pirates. They sink ships. They're terrifying. And it we was get to a, see it. It was a real jump scare moment for me. Even like we were watching the... It's like this beautiful... It looks like a beautiful blonde woman just leaning on this boat. And she's singing this kind of sea shanty. And I was already like, oh, there's going to be a jump scare. I could feel it. Like with all of the tales of sirens, I was like, uh-uh. It's not going to end right here. Something's going to happen. And then, yeah, when she turns into like the siren like the the killer she just grows like, yeah i don't know i saw more but yeah it's like, <laughs> I, I rewatched it she just grows fangs it's a uh, to me it was like a jump scare i was like ah! i wish they just did the same the whole time and they just lure them until they oh, just... like a sweet death not a sweet death like it could be brutal and they could die or be drowned or whatever but i wish they just stayed the same because it always looks deceiving but if they turn into like this scary looking vampire mermaid or whatever, then it's an immediate, oh, I'm in trouble. This is bad. But if they never expect it, then I, I think that's just a little creepier. But this was still really, really well done because Blackbeard is trying to lure out the mermaid because obviously they need a, a mermaid tier. So they send out a couple pirates on these rowboats and. 
while they're out there waiting for a while, I think they even start to think that the mermaids aren't coming because it's just been taking so long. And I think it's Scrum, right? That's his name? Yeah. That he starts singing. I think just out of boredom, he starts singing, and they tell him to shut up because that attracts the mermaids. And it does. So we see our first mermaid, and she comes up to the boat. And that right there is already... It already looks, like, so surreal to see, wait, how's this person kind of just floating on the water like that and then is able to lean on the boat and... Where did she come from? But Scrum, everybody already is like, it's a mermaid, stay away. We know that we know the tales. We're in danger. But Scrum, he he falls for it. He sees a very beautiful mermaid, and he even says, it, like he he was willing to die just to get a kiss from a mermaid. From this yeah. Mermaid. And they find out that they talk because they're like, oh, she could talk, and she says yes. And I think she asks him if he was the one that was singing the shanty. He says yes. And then she starts singing. And I want to hear the full version of this because it really does sound very beautiful. They give it like an echo oh, yeah. kind of effect. And it is so nice. I, I want to find the full version of that. I'll probably have to look it up after this. But but yeah, that's how the tales go. If you hear a mermaid singing that like before you even see how beautiful they look, you would hear their their voice and how beautiful it sounds and that will lure you to to them. So we got to see that too and then once he's so like enamored with her, he starts leaning in, then he pulls oh she pulls him into the water and then that's when you see her for what she really is, like she becomes this vampire mermaid. And then all her <laughs> other mermaid friends come along and start attacking the ship. And they swim so fast. They jump on the the, the boats. And it's, it's a crazy scene. But I really There's think even that's the scene... highlight of this whole movie to see that scene. There's a scene where they're like sicked on a boat, right? Where. Uh, where they're what? I, like they're, they're like. They're looking. We're looking at a boat in the distance. And all we hear is like the mermaid uh, high pitched, like screeching with men crying out. Oh, yeah, yeah. I that, forgot about that. That to me was so terrifying. Yeah. I wish we got more mermaids in this movie. I felt like it wasn't enough. We, there was a mermaid, you know, the one that we eventually get the tear from that we get to see. But mermaids, like, you know, like the like the tale that there were lore more pirates in. I really don't have an idea of how they could have included more of that, but I just feel like it was so short, but it was really well done. I think maybe I wanted to hear a full song or something, but <laughs> yeah, I just wanted a little bit more of that mermaid. You're sailing on the seas, and maybe you see them like swimming underneath in the water, and they build there's attention a, a little bit more. There's this... Um a scene in like the odyssey which is about odysseus in um, greek mythology where he they're sailing through waters that are um, filled with sirens which are mermaids and he wants to hear their siren song so badly that he makes his crew tie him to the mast and stuff their ears with cotton and it's a, it's in the book it's like a scene where he's like they're sailing through and he's hearing this beautiful music and he's shouting at the top of his lungs to be untied but the crew just has to like ignore him and keep working and keep sailing and things like that i don't know i kind of wanted to seem like in. they had to have earplugs yeah they had to stuff cotton in their ears i think they could have used the mermaids yeah they could have shown something like that like another crew of pirates you know falling to their their trap or yeah i just wanted them to be used kind of like the kraken the kraken was more was more in the movie in in uh dead man's chest and i feel like we got maybe three scenes three big scenes with the kraken i feel like the mermaid was just one yeah just one but yeah very well done but i would have liked a little bit more I can definitely see where they like there is possibilities that they could have been used more. But I'm a little more content with how they were used in this movie. They didn't overstay 
they're welcome. It kept us more intrigued about them. And ultimately, I think I'm more satisfied with that than just having more of like mermaids and stuff like that. But somehow the mermaids returned. Somehow the mermaids returned. But yeah, and then outside of that, I don't know if there's any other scenes that you want to highlight because that was it for me. And then just to end, I was excited by just Captain Jack saying, a pirate's life's for me. Like, uh, you will walk. <laughs> walk or walk. die. Do it one more clean sound bite. You will walk. Walk or die. <laughs> one more clean sound bite. We're just doing this. <laughs> we'll do it live. <laughs> we'll do it live. <laughs> I do like uh, some of the ways that um what's his name? Ian McShane. He played Blackbeard. And a lot of the way he delivered his lines were so good. I thought it was he he gave it his all playing Blackbeard. He he played like the the ruthless villain and yeah. You know, it, it, I'll use this to transition into the next one cuz I don't really have anything else to say about this movie. It was just kind of like a all right. This was all right. But he gave a lot more in his villain interpretation than Javier Bardem in Dead Men Tell No Tales. Mm, I like Javier. I like him better than Blackbeard. I don't know about that. Some line, like, Javier Bardem... Hey, it was my opinion. How do you not know about that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. What do you mean you don't know about that? <laughs> I like them better than Blackbeard. I don't know if you know about that, too. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I've thought about this. I just think that some of his line delivery... Like, he... Like, Penelope Cruz from... Um, on Stranger Tides, his wife told him, like, you need to do a Pirates movie. You're going to get so much money. Trust me, it's worth it. Because, you know, um, this movie, despite being with no Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan on Stranger Tides, it's another billion dollar hit. Like, it made yeah, more, I was surprised. It made a lot of money. The only other movie that hit a billion was the second movie. Even the third movie didn't hit a billion. It hit like 900 million, which is super close, but it did not hit a bill. My and guess on- is that it's the second one, Dead Man's Chess. The first one was such a hit. People were really excited for the second one. And then the third one was just, you know, the finale to finish it off. So I don't think it did. I don't think it had that same excitement. I don't know how it was marketed because I didn't see it in theaters. But yeah, and then this fourth one is coming off of the trilogy and it's coming off of, what was it, six years yeah. since the, the third one. So everyone is like, oh, more pirates. Let's see. What are they going to do? So yeah, I broke the bill. The, the billion dollar mark. Yeah, I definitely think there's something contributing to the the like the the gap too because like 2003 to 2006 that gives time for people to go home and buy like they get the they get the dvd they have spend time watching it and then it's like oh the sequel's coming out we got to go see yeah. it and it's then there's while. people we're excited yeah and then people who didn't really like the second movie were like all right we won't go see this the third one but then there's people who are like oh yeah we will and then that same thing once the whole trilogy is out it starts getting traction people start buying the dvds more people start um getting into it so then on stranger tides comes out and boom a billion dollars it's like the force awakens effect yeah if there's been gone for so long we have time to miss it exactly so on stranger tides definitely benefits from that Mm -hmm. but when we get to dead men tell no tales i feel like javier bardem could have given it a little more oomph. There were some times where he was doing some line deliveries that I was like, Javier, are you here? Did you fall asleep again? And he's like, bottle. And I'm like, oh, okay, he's awake. Nah, I think his line deliveries were very unique. And he delivered them in a way that was memorable. That's That, that scene where he's like in the middle of the oceans and it's like, I hate this bottle kills bottle and i'm like javier give me some emotion i feel like he was more memorable than than blackbeard to me what, what was blackbeard's uh stand out you will walk yeah that's only because carl called it out <laughs> <laughs> that's it walk or die <laughs> you will walk and javier has the jock's bottle jock bottle bottle you can't pronounce the s it's like this little s is like bottle no, I liked it. I liked the way he looked. 
there were it was granted it was another dead crew story but they were all like half dusted half snapped and <laughs> it just looked thanos. really cool half thanos now yeah. i see why you like this one <laughs> that's not really the reason why i really did uh, think when you when you act the way he did like boring lines just become more interesting because he's saying them a different way and i I'll feel like he's looking though. more interesting i think i'm like we're talking about portrayal but when it came to being an actual villain i do think he was more villainy than blackbeard because blackbeard was a pirate being a villain for a pirate but javier bardim who is playing captain salazar um he's a pirate hunter like he's a a spaniard who yeah. his he job hates pirates yeah his job was to hunt down pirates and he hates pirates and that to me is a much more fitting villain than another pirate than like just blackbeard and also i feel like he could compete with blackbeard with the ruthlessness because whenever he faced a crew he would kill everyone except the one so that he could tell the tale and because... tie in with the title dead men tell no tales that's right that's and right. it ties in and i thought that's it was right. great he leaves one person alive every time so that they could spread the word hey yeah salazar that's perfect look out for the salazar guy that's perfect because that ties into the whole dead men tell no tales and that's from the ride that's what you hear when you're going into the ride. Yeah, I'm surprised it took this long for the for a movie to be named Dead Man Tunnel Tales. But that definitely shows that this movie should have been the fourth. And yeah. the real fourth that we got was a side story. I think they felt, after making the fourth movie, like, no, we really need to return to the core story. And um, what's funny is that, so for on. On Stranger Tides, everybody returned except the director. But for the fifth movie, it's almost all new. Except one writer. One writer from the first movie, like then on. His name is Terry Rossio. Not even Hans was here, right? Not even Hans. This is music by Jeff Zanelli, who is a protege who worked under Hans Zimmer. But we have two directors for this movie named Joaquin Roning and Espen Sandberg. And then... The story is done by Terry Rocio, who worked on the first four movies, but his script. So there is a significant gap between um, On Stranger Tides and Dead Men Tell No Tales, and it's the longest. We go from 2011 to 2017, which is, what, eight, uh, six years? Six years. So the big reason that this movie took the longest time was two reasons, and Bruckheimer said it was script- and budget because they just no matter how hard they tried they really felt that they could not get the script to write and then they were and that was terry rocio who he worked on the four movies but he also did it with oh yeah um, you just reminded me wasn't mm -hmm. on stranger tides the highest budget for any movie ever yeah. or isn't it like top five highest budget i think it movie? is I think it's top five because their budget was three hundred and seventy eight million. Yeah. You just remind me of the budget thing when you said that. And I just remembered, yeah, one of these movies were it's, really high up there. Yeah, that's on Stranger Tides. Dead Men Tell No Tales. The budget is not exact. It on Wikipedia it gives me this estimate of two hundred and thirty to three hundred and twenty million. That's a huge gap. That's a little like ninety million dollar gap, but it's still less than on Stranger Tides. Yeah, and uh, they couldn't nail the script, so they brought in this guy called, where is it, Jeff Nathanson, and Jeff Nathanson is the one that started. Like he and Terry Rocio, they got together, and that's where like the script started coming together, and the story of the movie started coming together, and so from then on. Bruckheimer said that that's it. Like this movie is going to be the like last movie. This is going to be the movie to what's it called? He said he wanted to end it right. He wanted he to said, end this is our Avengers end game. <laughs> he Back spoke in with, 2017. This is he spoke with Kevin Feige and was like, I see what you're doing and I'm going to do that right now. This I is my end. Avengers end game. I bet he was the first one to know what 
Avengers 4 was going to be called. So just like to give some time estimates, Terry Rocio started working on the script in about 2008, but he didn't have a finalized script until 2014 when it was accepted by uh, Disney executives and was greenlit so they could start working on like production. And that was where uh, like everybody started coming back. Now, Orlando Bloom is in this movie. And it opens up. It opens up. In this and movie. none of us saw that. So we were all kind of like, whoa, Orlando Bloom's in this movie? That's this when is, it immediately felt like this is continuing the story. This is a real Pirates of the Caribbean movie. This we're is back a to spin-off. the main quest. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. took a little break, but now we're back. We're playing the campaign again. And Orlando... It was an awesome introduction, too, because oh, yeah. you, see, you see a little boy who we don't know who he is. He ties like a brick to his foot, right? Or like a pile of rocks or something. Mm-hmm. Dumps it in the sea, jumps in the sea. And then he just starts drowning, dropping all the way to the bottom. You see a sunken ship. And that sunken ship starts rising all the way to the top. And then, boom, who do we see? Orlando Bloom. Orlando Bloom as what the, an Dutch- entrance. the captain of the Dutchman. And we find the out captain. that the, the little boy is his son, Henry. Yeah. And Henry tells him, like, I think I know a way to break your curse. His name should have and- been, like, Jill. <laughs> Bill Turner, Jack, Will Turner, and Jill. No, it would have been no, Jack. At least arrived with L. Will and we already Gil. have Phil. Oh yeah, we had, Phil. T- <laughs> we had Phil in the last movie, the Christian boy. Gil. Gilbert. Yeah, Gil for short. Gil, Gil Turner. Turner. No. Yeah. yeah. I like Henry. Henry's cute. That's a rhyme. Will. Bill. Will. Bootstrap Bill. Who I was thinking, like, did they name him after anybody? Because she didn't name him after her dad. He didn't name him after his dad. They just picked Henry. Nah, yeah, they just picked Henry. Henry's cute, though. I like a cute, like, short name like that. Henry. But... Gil is shorter. But Gil doesn't roll off the tongue. What kind of... Gil. There's no rolling. It just comes out. Gil. Nah, I like Henry. Henry sounds cuter. I'm going to go to Bruckheimer and suggest a re-edit. <laughs> suggest a George Lucas re-edit. His name is Jerry Bruckheimer. You should have, have named... Have you thought of Gil? Question mark. Hashtag Dead Man Gil. Tell No Tales. Half ta- hashtag Gil Turner. <laughs> Make it happen. <laughs> but um, this little boy Henry tells his dad, Will Turner, that he believes... That finding the Triton of Poseidon can break his father's curse. And he intends to find the Triton by finding Jack Sparrow. And I like Will is like, you you stay away from that man. <laughs> you don't find him. Yep, yep. But Henry's not listening to him. And Henry goes on this quest to find Captain Jack Sparrow. And this quest takes him nine years. Henry is now a sailor in the Navy. And they... And he's on this ship that sails into the Devil's Triangle. And that's like the Bermuda Triangle, right? That's what that is? Pretty much. That's a reference, right? Yeah, like the Bermuda Triangle where a bunch of ships always go missing and aircraft and stuff. But they call it the Devil's Triangle. Yeah. And this is where they come upon Captain Salazar. who's was played by Javier Bardim. And and Captain Salazar kills everybody on this vessel except Henry, which is goes back to he leaves one man alive so they can live to tell the tale. Because Tony. Dead men. <clears throat> Dead men tell no tale. <laughs> exactly. So Henry um is he takes a little robo and he goes back to shore. Meanwhile, because this this movie also kind of follows the plot, like, structure of the first movie. We have one guy, Henry, who's trying to find Jack Sparrow to save his dad. And then it takes us now to this young astronomer named Karina Smith. And Karina is a scientist. But in the 1800s, if you were a woman who knew how to read, you were considered a witch. You were a witch. Burn the witch. (laughs) 
burn the witch. So she is arrested and is sentenced to die for witchcraft. But she um, somehow escapes and crosses paths with Jack Sparrow, who has resorted to oceans type heist. Where yeah, he's oceans. Not... <laughs> oceans twelve type heist. Yeah, oceans twelve. <laughs> Type Very specifically, heist. Ocean's 12 type heist. Yep, yep. And <laughs> in which he tries to steal this um, safe from a bank and it just goes horribly wrong. Hijinks ensues. And they like Jack, and throughout all of this, um, Karina is able to go free. Henry is able to, because Henry was, his sleeves were cut, making him like a deserter because he didn't want to sail into the triangle. So when he washes up on shore, that tells the people who found him, like the the soldiers that found him, oh, he was a he was a coward, like he was a mutineer. So we're gonna like lock him up. But in this chaos, he also gets away. And throughout this like blunder of a bank robbery, what's interesting though is, and the only thing I kind of don't like about this movie is how Jack Sparrow is. Yep. I don't know. We got to bring that up. Yeah. He From just the very seems... beginning, I feel like he never really recovered, but they did purposely want to make him like fall from grace a little bit. So he's drinking a lot more and he doesn't really care about his reputation or anything. He even like gives up the compass like to yeah. buy rum. So it's like... I get that that was very intentional, but then the rest of the movie, he doesn't really feel like he found his groove again. Yeah, it feels like he lost his footing and he never recovered because like he like, first of all, he looks different. He doesn't look the same, like something about yeah, the hair. hair. Yeah, he's got this like weird, fluffier, blonder he's wig. Six years older. Yeah, that, but like the thing is, like they could have given him the same wig from the original movies, but for As some a reason, six-year-old. I mean, it's a fourteen-year-old wig. He's got these blonder highlights. It also feels like because Jack in the first four movies, at least there were moments he got serious. You know, even in the fourth movie when he saves Angelica instead of um, Bar like Blackbeard, and you know, in all these movies, he has moments where you feel he's got that moral ground where it's like when he does something heroic, it stands out because you wouldn't expect him to do something heroic. But he has those moments. And in this movie, you never see that. He just kind of becomes this like I've never felt he's a side character. But in the last movie, it feels like he's a side character. Yeah, I feel like this is the amount of time they they thought they were going to have him for their first movie, like how they were going to treat him for the first movie, but he ended up really standing out. And in this movie, very side character. I didn't feel like he was as smart as he was in the other ones or as cunning or, you know, I feel like he very, he was just very like go with the flow and I'll take the punches as they come. But yeah, it was strange. It was strange. And I, I wanted him to recover from it, like make a full, like I thought it was going to be part of the plot where he's like, all right, I'm back. I'm Captain Jack Sparrow from the Isle of Tortuga. Yeah. But what I he, think he never that did I was when I was doing kind of my research, I was looking back at what could have been the reason for it. And what's interesting is that you would think in the fifth movie and it's true. No director or executive really had a hand in why Jack is the way Jack is. Nobody told Johnny Depp to like be a certain way. But what did happen though is Johnny Depp, in between the fourth and fifth pirate movie, he married Amber Heard. Oh boy. And you know, it's gotta be brought up a little bit if anybody is familiar with Johnny Depp's relationship to Amber Heard. You know, a lot went on these past couple of years with Amber Heard and him and um what was it? He was, he sued her for defamation because she accused him of sexual assault. But, you know, that was found to be not true because in reality, it was Johnny Depp who was being um, domestically abused in their relationship. And a lot came to light in the you trials. You think this happened very early on? Because you said they married between the fourth and the fifth movie? They they mar he married her in 2015 and he divorced her in 2017. Oh wow! So okay, yeah. So that it, lines up perfectly. 
it is with the production of this movie. Movie went into production in 2014 yeah. and then it premiered in 2017. So that lines up perfectly with why his behavior is the way it is. That really sucks. I mean, we we won't really know. We can't really Yeah. This is wild speculation. Yeah. But I really think the reason he's kind of the way he is is because he was going through a really rough relationship at home and that affected because he is the guy like he is captain jack sparrow even like in the heyday of pirates during the trilogy he was the one that would give instruction to the um like disney world actors and disney like the disney world and disneyland actors so he is he is invested in this character he loves this character but i feel like being in that kind of relationship maybe tainted not just his behavior of jack sparrow but how he acted overall in in movies because i'm trying to look at movies he did in those years and let me see here filmography it's hard to say because it wouldn't only be on him you know because there's writers there's a director he was also written a different way you know he was saying different things i know the director wasn't you know is not gore Brzezinski, what was his name? Uh, yeah, uh, but Gore Verbinski. Verbinski, yeah, is none of the the original guys, but it could have been a number of things. That could have been one of them, but it could have been a lot of yeah, things. But I, in my personal opinion, I definitely think the reason Jack Sparrow is not really Jack Sparrow in this movie is because Johnny Depp was kind of going through a rough patch in his life. Could be, it could be. It was a big deal. It wasn't. It is like, but the the good thing is that Jack Sparrow. It what's kind of interesting in this movie is that he doesn't carry it, but there are still a lot of good things that do carry this movie. I think we're used to like, at least for me, Jack Sparrow is my favorite character. So in the first, like, that's like what I immediately notice about the fifth movie. But the good thing about the fifth movie is it does bring out a lot of good characters. Barbosa is in it as usual, but Karina Smith, I really like her. I feel Henry yeah. could have been a little bit more diverged into. It just felt like he was a carbon copy of Will Turner, but less um, resourceful. He Caroline, was just kind if of. If you put the picture of Henry. And the other guy's name, who I don't even remember from the fourth one, who's who's the priest or whatever. <laughs> Phil. I wouldn't even. I can't even tell you which one's which. To be honest, I wouldn't be able to point to you and tell you which one's Henry. Yeah, it just felt like Henry was like, okay, insert good boy, and that was it. That's all Henry is. <laughs> yeah, he's just a good. He's like the human personification of a golden retriever. He's a good boy. But, Meanwhile, yeah, Car- Karina really stood out. Karina Smith is so cool. She has so many funny moments with the crew and even just like talking and things like that. And she's so smart. It's so neat to see like this other dynamic. The last like female character, like we've had two, we've gotten Elizabeth Swan, who is this woman from a privileged lifestyle, but we see that she can be kind of chaotic neutral and be a little bit on the underhanded sign. And then we get Angelica, who's just like a pirate as a pirate could be and Blackbeard's daughter, and it shows. But then we get Karina Smith, who's just this genius of a woman who is able to chart stars and decipher this map. And she has a map that no man can read, but she's like, which is fortunate because I'm a woman. So she's able to, like, interpret it and to see the signs. She's academically inclined. Yeah, exactly. And she has so many good moments in this movie that I feel like she really carried it for me. Karina Smith was kind of the best thing about this movie. This also makes me think, again, this is the first movie that Jack Sparrow actually feels like a side character. Mm-hmm. All the other ones, he has such a great presence on screen that it doesn't really feel that way. But this movie, you know, had Orlando Bloom and Kira Knightley, but they were barely in it. So this was technically another movie without them. And... As we, as we can see from four and five, they bring in like new lead characters because I think Captain Jack Sparrow is best when he's working off somebody. Yeah. He is yeah. supposed to be in that side character 
slot. But yeah, this is the first time that we really see him fall to the background because he just doesn't have like that. I don't know the same energy that he had for the other ones, but but yeah, Karina was a good lead, very good lead, and like you said, like she brought something different. Like Angelica, she was yeah, she was just like very loyal to her dad, and she she was part of the pirate's life. You know, she did her own pirating and conning and stuff, but she was different from Elizabeth as well. Yeah, they come from different backgrounds, like you said. Um, Elizabeth had her own journey to learn how to be pirate and then eventually pirate king and then that kind of got dropped but yeah then Angelica grew up under the the eye of Blackbeard and yeah and then Karina just very book smart and just smart in general and she could hold her own and in this movie we see how these three like good boy Henry smart Karina and Jack, they coincide because now they're going to start looking for the trident of Poseidon because this trident has the ability to break any curse in the sea. And oh yeah, but one more thing about Karina. Wasn't she also not believing all of this pirate stuff? Yeah, yeah. She's a skeptic. Yeah, she's, very skeptical, she, skeptical about all of it. Her heart belongs to science and her brain. So yeah. she was like, ghosts, skeletons, like, no way. And she thought, like, you all are crazy. Krakens, no. Yeah, no, no, none of it. And then... Stars, uh, yes. <laughs> Stars, CEC. Ghosts, no, no. Uh-uh. No, thank you. And I'm trying to remember, how did they get with Barbosa? Because I know that... Where is it? Barbosa. so Salazar is taken out pretty much every crew along the way until he finds Jack and one of the crews was under his like it was his fleet so yeah and he's told by like his other crewmates that oh yeah Salazar's on the loose he's killing pirates again so he has to confront him not only to stop but like all the killings of his fleet but also because he didn't he oh, also want revenge on him, or the, is, he, is it just to he, stop the fleet of? He talk. I remember he talks to a like a witch, and the witch tells him to. Oh yeah, I um, wish I was in his own ship. Yeah, yeah, and he yeah, tells like weird. the witch tells him something like because Barbosa is now since he has the sword of Blackbeard from the last movie, Barbosa is like super rich. He's got this fleet of ships now he's like a commodore pirate super rich but then this witch tells him that salazar is back and salazar has already killed several pirates at the sea and is destroying ships in barbosa's fleet and so barbosa meets like toe-to-toe -to -toe with salazar and tells salazar give me one day until the next sunrise that uh i'll bring you captain jack sparrow so then he goes yeah, and consults like with that. this yeah, so he goes and consults with this witch, and the witch tells him, oh, um, find Jack, and then Jack will lead you to the trident, and the trident will lead you to your treasure. And then um, he says, like, how can I find Jack? And she goes, that depends. Is this treasure worth dying for? And he goes, yes. And so she, and so Jack, in the, like, early in the movie, traded his compass for a drink, and somehow this witch got a hold of it and gives Barbosa the compass. So Barbosa is able to find Jack that way. And then uh, I'm trying to remember, it's when Jack and Henry and Karina are on like a little boat. They're on a sloop, right? And that's where they get pursued by yeah, Salazar. Yeah, remember what it was called? The... I don't remember the name of the sloop. This, the Breaking uh, Gull? Oh, the, or the, this... the, di the Dying Gull. The Dying Gull. They're on this like sloop, which is yeah. a little boat for those who haven't played Sea of Thieves. It's a little boat with one mast of sails. And uh, it's um, so they're sailing to this island so that way they could find. Uh, I can't remember what exactly. Oh, th that's what it is. Like they're just they see the Salazar boat and they flee to an island because Salazar and his crew cannot touch land. And it's on this island that Jack gets like roped into a wedding. <laughs> 
to like we also marry see the zombie sharks. Oh yeah, the zombie sharks. That's what that's where yeah. the zombie sharks came out, and that's where Karina's like, ghosts, zombie sharks, yeah. what? And that's where she kind of starts this isn't believing in, my in this science textbook. This isn't in any of my books, and Henry is like, ha. <laughs> Meanwhile, Henry has good boy syndrome and is falling for Karina. Yeah, just same plot as Christian boy in the last movie. He's just he's falling in love. We don't know why, but he is. And although with Karina, it's understandable. I was over here falling in love with Karina. I was like, you go, mm-hmm. girl. You got this. Woman power. Woo. But um, on this island, they're found by this guy who wants Jack to marry his sister. And like, it's shenanigans. It's pirate shenanigans. But then Barbosa comes in, stops the wedding, and he allies himself with Jack and gives him back his compass and says like, hey, you help me out. I'll give you the pearl once more. Um like well we'll get rid of salazar together and it's then that's when they pull out the pearl from the bottle and they put like the little pearl like they put the pearl back into the water and it like forms up to its original size yeah i I remember that part now yeah and then we get it's when they're sailing to the place that has all of those stars like on the ground where they would find the map to Mm. find uh the trident we get my favorite scene in the movie (laughs) sort of And that is where um, Karina, since she's the only one who can read the map, she's the one at the helm steering the boat and Barbosa is with her. And she says how like that the because he says like that's an interesting journal you have. And she's like, it's the only thing left of my father. Like I believed he was a scholar. He left me on the, the doorstep of this orphanage. But he gave me the name like with nothing. My, my father left me on the doorstep of this orphanage. And the only thing he gave me was this book and the name of the st- of the brightest star in the sky. And you can see Barbosa's face like changing and realizing. And he goes, well, that would be Karina. And she goes, yes, that's my name. And that's where Barbosa it hits him. Karina Smith is his long lost daughter. And wow. And I was spoiled to this. I'm sorry. I was emotional. I was not able to feel these emotions. Yes, you were. Nope. Yes, you were. No, not for that scene, no. What? No. You're like, oh, I know what this means because I'm not going to spoil it. I'm like, wait a second. And then my, my brain turned on. It was like, and then it was ticking. Why does your brain like, turn on at the most like, unopportune times when I rely on it to be off? And then I was like, wait a second, you're saying it's a spoiler, so that means, oh, she's his daughter. She's his daughter. Well, I mean, it wasn't a spoiler for very long, because like the very next scene is Jack Sparrow being like, what was the name of that girl that we met on that one island? Uh, wasn't it like Margaret The Smith? one that you hooked up with? The one that you hooked up with, like specifically 19 years ago? Uh-huh. <laughs> You and told Bar- her if we ever have kids together, name her after a star or something like that. You remember? He was like, didn't Margaret die? <laughs> and then that's where Barbosa's like, the best thing I could do for that child was to like leave her on that doorstep than to be like the daughter of a pirate. Absolutely. He's right. And, yeah, he is. I mean, look at her. She came out great. Super smart. She wouldn't have yeah. been that way on pirates. Very into science. An no astronomer. And she probably... She probably in, she's into zodiac signs and stuff. Oh no, <laughs> that's an astrologer, <laughs> not an astronomer. I don't. I didn't say that. I mean, that's the zodiac. But she's probably into zodiac signs. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> so now that Barbosa realizes Karina is his long lost daughter, we get this beautiful scene where Jeffrey Rush just gives it his all in the acting department, and. It's the same that, like I said, with Kira Knightley in the third movie, seeing her dad die. But in this movie, we see the opposite. We see instead of a lost father, we see a found daughter. And that emotion is played so beautifully on Jeffrey Rush's face as Barbosa with the way his eyes glimmer and the way his mouth slightly opens and the music in the background and even the way he steps away. Wait, so and... how did this work? Because this was the first time we saw it, but you already knew about this because you Be- read it up or something? Because I play Kingdom Hearts and she comes out in the She's Kingdom Hearts mobile game. Oh my gosh. They leave no stone unturned in Kingdom Hearts. I know, with so many spinoff games. 
So you gotta the turn them all over. In the mobile game of Kingdom Hearts, you can buy her outfit, and then like in the story, when you play more, you go to like a pirate's life and stuff like that. And they call it Karina Barboza. No, no, but like there's like a line in there where she says like I'll be able to sail like my father, and I was like, who's your dad? So I looked this up years ago. Where I was just okay. like, who is Karina Smith's? And then when you look up Karina Smith, her name on the Wikipedia is Karina Adjust. Smith is is Kami- Karina Smith Barbosa. Gotcha. So I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, she's a Barbosa. She's a Barbosa. But so in this plot now, as they are going to like, Karina is able to show them the island where the trident is found. And it's this really beautiful scene where like all of these stones on the on the shore light up like stars. And then the the sea splits like something out of the book of Exodus. And in the center is the trident. And so then we get this cue, like t- the the pirates action choreography where they're walking down like this dry land. But then also like Henry was captured by Salazar. So now Salazar is like possessing him and he uh oh yeah that was weird we didn't even yeah know that, that that just kind of happened it was fast oh, we didn't and... even know it could happen yeah yeah it's just yeah it happened it's pirate's life for me yeah and then uh so we have this fight scene between jack and henry and uh karina is trying to like get this the trident and run but then what was what else happens? Oh, then Salazar gets the trident and he frees Henry and he like uses it so that way uh what was it like his men or something? Like he just he uses it so now he has the power of the sea. And then uh what was it? Cuz then after that that's whenever Henry and Karina they say like oh all must divide. Like to break the, the, to break the curse of the sea, all must divide. And so that's where they realize, like, we have to break the trident. So while Jack and Salazar are fighting, Henry breaks the trident. And it's whenever they break the trident that all of the curses of the sea are broken as well. And so that means that, like, Salazar's men, Salazar and himself, the undeadness... uh, Is gone. Is gone. They're alive now. But they're also at the bottom of the sea. That's just split. Very Curse of the Black Pearl. Yeah. And so that and so as the sea begins to close in on itself, um, Barbosa tosses the anchor from the pearl down. And as they're all climbing up on the pearl, Barbosa, he's on like the rope telling them, like, come here, like get on the anchor. And as they're climbing up, that's when Salazar like runs and jumps on the the anchor. On, on the anchor. Climbing up the chain. And then we get like the scene where Barbosa looks down and he realizes that they're not going to be able to make it while Salazar is still pursuing them. So it's when he looks at Karina and he like holds Karina up and Karina's like, who am I to you? Because he can she can tell that he's looking at her. Like this she's is after special. she grabbed onto his arm and saw that he has a tattoo of the constellation. That's, that's right. On the journal. That's right. And then that's when... She, Things are getting, you know, they're connecting and she has to ask that. Yep. And then what happens? So then it's whenever she sees the tattoo in his arm that she looks at him and she goes, who am I to you? And he looks at her and goes, treasure. And ah, my emotions. And and that's when the tears flowed. Oh, yeah. My tears were flowing. I was emotional. Already the scene where he discovers that that's his daughter is already... Like, wow. And then in the same movie, he dies for her. And and he he lets go of the anchor. He takes down Salazar with him. And it does. He's falling down. He's looking at Karina the whole time. Like, just A plus Jeffrey Rush with the way he acted. Because he's looking at Karina the whole time. And Karina's looking at him. This is the father she's been searching for. And and aspiring to be like, but then she's realizing that it's him, but she doesn't see that as a bad thing either. The way that he looked at her and the way that he like talked about her, 
she can tell that like he loved her and so she's even like no but he's looking at her and the ocean just swallows him up and we lose the pirate with the most style captain barbosa she wasn't yelling out no or anything because her she found out her she was yeah she was her daughter for like a split second you know right before he jumped and died yeah but yeah, you, you can, can tell, see, like, you know, she had a face. lot to she had a lot to register in that moment. But mm-hmm. yeah, she was taking it all in. And um, yeah, we were watching this movie. <laughs> You're just like, hold your breath, Barbosa, under a thousand gallons of water. You can hold your it. breath. Hold your breath. <laughs> you can buoy up. Keep the oxygen you just in just your float diaphragm. To the top from the very bottom of the sea floor. He'll you float. Do. He'll float, too. For that, for the reveal. Of the what am I to you? I, I gotta let them know that. Yeah, I was like shouting out like, tell her uh, she's everything to you. She, she's her, your entire life. And he said the best possible answer for a Pirates movie. That she's treasure. Treasure. Treasure in his eyes. That Nothing so... greater to a pirate than treasure. That was and, so beautiful. And then at that point, I was wondering, why is my face wet? And why does my heart <laughs> feel warm? <laughs> Why does my heart hurt? Why is Caroline sobbing on the other end of the mic? Why do I feel like calling up my dad? Like <laughs> I didn't understand what was happening. Why was my nose running? What was all, what was happening? I didn't understand. It was a powerful scene. It was so powerful. And then it calls back to the beginning of the movie where um that witch tells him like this this trident's going to lead you to treasure. But is that treasure worth dying for? And Yes and yes. That was the most emotional scene in all of the franchise for me. I never got that close to ever crying. I I completely agree. Yep. That was incredible. That was amazing. And what's awesome, too, is the way the movie sets up how much you love, like for me at least, like how much I loved Karina. And then to find out Karina is related to another character I really love. And then you see them play off each other and it works so well. And then mm-hmm. Barbosa gives his life for his child. It's amazing. It really did remind me of Guardians 2 a lot. Not in a joking way, but more of like Barbosa was a non traditional father, just like Yondu was a non traditional father. And he really did care about her because you can't have, you can't raise a child as a pirate on a ship with other pirates and he just knows he was self-aware enough to know that she won't be around good role models the life that he lives is not good for her to be influenced by and he had to give her up yeah she had yeah she had a better chance that was a loving decision i agree she had a better chance of making it without him than making it with him but yeah like fate was kind enough that he still was able to see her or he would have to be breaking her out of Davy Jones along with himself. Davy Jones locker. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, and then the very end scene. How does it tie up the entire franchise? So here we go. The end the whole reason why Henry, good boy Henry, started this quest was when they destroyed the trident, that meant that Will is free from being Because it the, broke all curses it, in the sea. All curses of the sea. So that means now that Will is free from being the captain of the Dutchman and can just be Will Turner. So he goes to shore, he hugs his son, and then out from the horizon beyond the hills runs Elizabeth Swan, Kira Knightley, in no speaking roles. She this just is shows- what I was saying. They should have brought Kira back, but all right, this is yeah, fine. Yeah, you were Orlando like, saying, come back. like, Will, like Orlando Bloom's here, but why didn't Kira come back? It would have yeah. been an easy paycheck for her. And then we see, like, the camera and cuts and it's her running. <laughs> running. She's running a, to Disney HQ to pick up yeah, that it'll be All they had to do was pitch. You have to wear a beautiful dress, <laughs> run on the hills, and you get to sleep next to Orlando Bloom. And she's like, I'm in. Where do I sign? <laughs> She didn't and say then any. Dizzy told her, "You will talk." Like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> you will run. No, I don't think I will. <laughs> she had no speaking lines. No. She just showed up to epic, epic music. She looked like my man, and then like just on her face, like just the look on her face, and then she ran to Will Turner, and then off in the distance, Jack is on the pearl. 
the captain of the Pearl once again. And he sees from his spyglass that the Turner family has reunited. Oh, yeah. Also, we forgot to put Henry and Karina admit that they like each other. They're an item and they kiss. And so like there, there they go too with Henry's parents. But then Jack is now on the Pearl. He's the captain once again. And he says, I want to see something beyond my beloved horizon. Yeah. And that's where he closes his compass. And so I don't know how much more closure they can get past this uh, because we do have a post credit scene. Oh, right. Because like I said, Kira Knightley signed on for two things, running through the hilltops and sleeping next to, to sleep or, with, oh. or next to sleeping Orlando Bloom. OK. And we were saying the same thing in different ways. Sure. Sleeping and, with Orlando Bloom. Sleeping next to Orlando Bloom. Okay. And so they were both in, asleep. in this post credit scene, Will and Elizabeth are asleep in their bed and Davy Jones appears in their room. But then Will, like in the scene, we think we believe he wakes up and he assumes he has a nightmare that Davy Jones was in their room and he goes back to sleep. But the camera pans to the floor where it's obviously wet and there's barnacles on the floor. Revealing that it was no dream. Davy Jones is back. Because it was real. It was real. He's so it back. does it does leave it open for uh, a sequel, but to me, it's done. This was the perfect ending to that franchise. It's done because they stabbed his heart. He's definitely dead. Unless, again, the Davy Jones locker thing. But that means no one is ever really gone. And they can always come back. He and if he does his, come back, uh, he's going to look like a regular human. He's not going to look... Because the curse is broken. Yeah. So he's going to look like a regular guy. He's not going to look like a squid man. Like we're used to. He had his Thanos moment of being the villain for a part one and part two movie. Yeah, he was the Thanos. And I feel like, you know, that's it. Let, let it Let it be. Let it be. I think this end credit scene was definitely of like not really thought out. Like they didn't think when we do a six, we want to continue it with Davy Jones. They were just thinking, what could we do? Just leave it open. Open it up to something. Throw anything in there. And they just decided Davy Jones. It yeah, really I don't want to. anyone. But. We could talk about the six maybe a little bit, but like Dead Men Tell No Tales, it was good. I liked it a lot. It definitely felt more in line with the main franchise than On Stranger Tides did. Yeah. And the music was pretty good, too. You know, even though it wasn't Hans Zimmer, it still felt part of everything. I didn't notice it was off of any type. The only thing that I noticed was that it didn't use, like, as much of that that the main trilogy used. Instead, it focused on a different part of the theme song where it was just that like... Like, that's what it focused on instead rather than what was so noticeable about the theme song from the first three movies. But it's still all part of the same tune. And they did still use that same like section for the end credits with that. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm trying to think if on Stranger Tides had any effect on what happened in Dead Man Tell No Tales. The only effect that it had was that Barbosa had a peg leg. <laughs> yeah, right. And I guess the Black Pearl as well. Oh, no. Wait, what happened? when was the Black Pearl in the jar? Yeah, with, with Black Yeah, Pearl. yeah, yeah. That was uh, on Stranger Tides. Yeah, Yeah, so right. that carried over. Mm-hmm. There were some things. There were some things. But I still feel like if it was removed, Dead Man Tell No Tales could still be a part four. Yeah. Because it I felt am... like the actual continuation. Yeah. I am glad they made it because it did give a happy ending to our characters from the first three movies. You know, everybody ended up where everybody wanted to be. Will yeah, and Elizabeth. After all are, this time. Yeah. Will and Elizabeth are now together and can stay together with their son. And then Jack has the pearl. Yeah, he's free. He's on the sea. Exactly. He's the captain of the Black Pearl, where he always wanted to be. Mm-hmm. So I'm very happy with 
how it ended. And I hope that it just, I kind of want it to end right there. The sixth film is still in development. In fact, they still don't even have a script done. The first draft of the screenplay, like, um, let me see, when did this get recorded? So the last movie was 2017, right? The last movie is 2017. And in May of twenty four of 2020, May 14th of 2020, um, Jerry Bruckheimer said that the first draft of the screenplay would soon be finished, but it's still not confirmed. This, like The script is still not even done. And they're not even sure if they're going to get Johnny Depp back in this role. So it might be a soft reboot of the franchise. And there's been a couple of characters that have been signed on to be like not characters, actors such as like Karen Gillian. The thing is, is that the girl who played Karina Smith, her name is Kaya Scodelario. She is contractually signed on to return for a sixth film. So she's available, but that does not guarantee they'll bring her back. Yeah. But I don't know. I just kind of feel like, if it was up to me, don't don't do it. I guess like a soft reboot would be the best because just don't mess with like these classic characters. But it's just so like these movies were so good. I don't know if they should continue to go forward. They shouldn't. It should end. But if they they're going to go forward. So when they go, go forward, yeah, just reboot it. Don't bring Captain Jack back. Let him be free on the seas already. Leave everyone to their happy ending and just show us new pirates. Yeah. This is what I was telling you before. It's not called Captain Jack Sparrow and the Dead Man's Chest. It's Pirates of the Caribbean. So it could really be any pirate. And yeah. that's okay. It whether or not that's anyone. a good decision or whether or not we, we care about these characters or they're as good as Captain Jack Sparrow, that's a whole new story. But if, no, when they continue this, I say reboot it. Yeah, because, I mean, the other option is in June 2020, it was announced that Disney was developing a female-led Pirates movie with Margot Robbie set to be the star of the film. I'm not excited for this movie. I don't want this to be a thing. I want them to stop making this be a thing. I wonder when, when they say female-led and they're choosing Margot Robbie, I wonder if she's going to be, like we were talking about, I wonder if she's going to be the Jack Sparrow or if she's going to be the Elizabeth and Will of the movie. I don't know if anybody can be like, but like, yeah, I think they want her to be. You know what position I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. The main role or like the the strong side character? The pirate character or the. That's a better way to put it. Yeah, is she going to be a pirate or is she going to be somebody else? The straight man. Yeah, I think she's going to be a pirate if they get her, because I I think of like the way with Harley Quinn, all the makeup and everything. I think they want. I think they they see that. Uh, We'll see. Actually, no, they don't. They don't. (laughs) Yeah, there's been plenty of not plenty, but all the girl pirates we saw, their teeth remained clean. Yep. But. Yeah, uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, yeah, you were saying that they were still, like, writing up a first draft or whatever. Well, according to their track record, they still got time because now they've been on, like, a six-year cycle. That's true. So, so they have until, like, next year to make something happen. Or to yeah. Release this movie. So. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, for me, like I said, this franchise is done. Five movies, they're all great. Like I said, even On Stranger Ties, despite being the weakest of the pirates, is not a weak movie by any means. It's still, no, I liked it. yeah, it was still entertaining. It was still good. Like I, I enjoyed it. It even had the tall tales that I like explaining the Fountain of Youth. Yeah, Blackbeard. Like it, it's classic. It's pirate. You know, it's classic pirate. All right, Tony, we've reached all of the films to cover. Do you yeah, have a we ranking? We you have a it. ranking. We did it. I do have a ranking. Hit me. I'm not going to tease you guys. I'm going <laughs> to give you my number one first. And I'm not going to trick you either. Well, actually, I think I did trick you a little bit. Uh, my number one is Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. Wow. Yeah. Davy wow. Jones and the Kraken. It's unmatched in my book. I love it. It's peak pirates, 
So it's at the very top of my list. I love it so much. I get so excited seeing that Kraken. I love the story. <laughs> I love everything that intertwines. I love the all the the cannibal island and like uh Captain Jack having to escape from being roasted on there and and the guys having to climb out when they're like swinging back and forth on that rope trap or whatever. And I just love the whole thing. I think there's if you watch that one movie, you get a lot of awesome pirate characters and story and action and that kraken is unbeatable yeah it's unbeatable yeah you're right you're right it's, it's awesome it's cool it's cool but yeah you, you want to say your number five or number one i don't know how you want to do this you want me to tell I, you the whole list or you want to go tit for tat yeah we'll go for tit for tat i'll okay. do number one my okay. number one is i know what it is you want to say it? You want me to say it? I'm gonna tell you what it is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me, no, let me write it down. No, no, no. I'll just say I think your number one is uh, the, uh, Curse of the Black Pearl. Yeah, you're right on the mark. Yeah, yeah? it's, it's yep. Curse of the Black Pearl. Yep. That's my number one. I love it so much. I think I can guess your whole list. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> Tony's gonna tell you all my list, everybody. Do you think I can guess your whole list? I yeah, I think you can. I think you can. I, I'm pretty transparent about my emotions. So go ahead. What's your number two? My number two is the Curse of the Black Pearl. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. Now let me make this, this the distinction because I I feel like I could do this for a lot of movies. I can separate what I enjoyed more and. What's my favorite? I could separate it from what I think is literally a better movie. I think The Curse of the Black Pearl is the best of all of them. I think it is the very top. It's just so strong. It's well written. Everything makes sense. There's almost like no plot holes or very minor of anything. Is such a solid, solid movie. But I just get more enjoyment from, from the second one, from Dead Man's Chess. Um, so if I had to do a different list of like, I don't know, critically, what's the best movie? I'll probably put it, I'll probably put the Black Pearl as number one, but my personal favorite, number two, Dead Man's Chess is number one, and then Curse of the Black Pearl. I feel that. Yeah, yeah. I get that. That's fair. But we're going with our emotions on this one about what we yeah. like. Yeah, I'm keeping it um, emotional. Yeah. Excitement levels. So what do you got? Number two. I thought you were going to guess it. Oh, okay. I think your number two is um, At World's End. Man, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Am I easily so readable? No, I think I just think about this. Okay. I know you. <laughs> I know you. That you do. All right. But why is it number two? I I love it. I I've said it. My favorite scene is in the whole franchise is the the wedding, like Will and Elizabeth getting married in the middle of the fight and Barbosa officiates and then the camera cuts and there's Jack Sparrow having this epic fight scene with uh Davy Jones on top of the mass and they're just like the the theme song's going full blast. And then we even have like that awesome death scene at the end with uh, with Beckett and it's action all the way through. We see pirate hell. We get that scene with um, with her father, just everything about it. I am hooked from the beginning, emotionally invested seatbelt on like I'm in and it had me the whole movie. I went through its ups and downs, the emotions. It's just back to back. Amazing. D uh, at world's end i love it's a it. fantastic finale it's yeah like everything you want exactly a full full out war on the sea cannons flying everywhere whirlpool rain thunder and storming <laughs> rain <laughs> sword fights davy jones like, that and then that music it's like oh, yeah bam. It's just and ah. of course the just the barrage of cannonballs on on Beckett's ship. 
It's that, so cool. And then, of scene. course, when Will turns into the captain of the Dutchman, it's just like, wow, wow. Yeah, he's, he just emerges from the sea with, with the Flying Dutchman. It's such an it epic delivers. of a movie. Like, it, it's it takes the Curse of the Black Pearl, slides you in to the pirate's life, but at World's End just dunks you. It's like, here you go. It's great. It's, yeah, it it's has. so good. Let me see. Yeah, I think it has literally every character that we've met up to this point and and more yeah the other pirate lords as well i do love like going to the pirate lords like we we're going to singapore and then like the vote i love everything every scene is to me is fascinating there's no boring moment in this movie it's just missing a kraken that's it yeah i could i could (laughs) have gone with more kraken i could have gone with some more kraken yeah still out there what happened to it it's still out there I also have to say, I forgot to mention this, but I love that the Kraken is like on demand. You know, they can yeah. call out the Kraken. That's yeah. really cool. Okay. But what are we up to? We just did what? Number, number three. Oh, yeah, we, that was number two. We just did number three? Oh, we're up we to number did, three. Yeah, we're up to number three. What's your number three? Okay. I think at this point, it won't be a surprise anymore. But yeah, my number three is At World's End. Yeah, yeah. I, end, yeah. Yeah. The first three are just like they have to be just in their own order, but they're definitely the top three of yeah. Pirates movies. And I, I gave away my third one right there with that. I know. But, you just said it. I'm like, okay, so number two. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, it's just, it goes without saying the first three have to be the top three. They're yeah. so good. And then I think once we got that out the way, we can, by process of elimination, figure out the last two as well. Yeah. So I'll, I'll just say mine right off the bat now. Uh, my number three, obviously, it's Dead Man's Chest, and mm-hmm. then number four for me is Dead Men Tell No Tales. Same here. That's, yeah, and then number five is On Stranger Tides. Same here. Yeah, it's just uh, when once you get to that like initial trilogy, you get all of these epic, amazing moments. It's impossible to not put them on your top three, and even then, like the way you said it, with you know, the Crystal Beck Pearl is i guess the best made movie when it comes to film critic wise but honestly to me you can't have one without the other with all three of these films you ha- once you watch the first one you got to watch two and three i would also say i will not rate any of these rotten yeah i yeah we're not going by rotten tomatoes no, today I'm not, I'm not gonna look it up i refuse to even look at the percentages yeah. because yeah all of these movies are great even the, like I said, even the week, it's just not a weak movie. But just so the listeners know, we did mention this in the other episode, but only The Curse of the Black Pearl, according to Rotten Tomatoes, is fresh. Every other yeah. movie is rotten. I don't know why. Which is absolute tomfoolery. They deserve, those film critics deserve to be tossed into Davy Jones' locker for giving it that score. With no return. Leave it With there. no return. But yeah, man, we covered it all. We did it. All the Pirates movies. Movies so near and dear to our hearts. I didn't think we could do this, but we did. We did. And I'm so glad we did. We've been on a Pirates high since playing Sea of Thieves and watching the last two movies. We were like, we got to do this. We got to do this. Yeah, anybody who plays games, try out Sea of Thieves if you haven't. Also, watch the movies if you haven't. Or if you don't want to invest all the time, look up the individual scenes, at least. Look up the Kraken scene. Look up the, the Lord Bennett uh, getting blown up by Cannonball scene. Look up look the up Whirlpool the, fight. The Will and, yeah, the Whirlpool fight with Will and fight. Elizabeth's wedding and Jack Sparrow fighting Davy Jones. Mm-hmm. Look it all up. I highly recommend the Kraken scene. I mean, how often do you see a Kraken? Not often. And Not in Sea of often. Thieves, you don't even see the full Kraken. You just no. see the tentacles. And in this movie, you get all Krakened up. It's awesome. But yeah, I think we've made it to the end, Caroline. I think we've been talking for a long time. And if I you're think still we all listening... made it to the end, guys. <laughs> I think we all made it to the end. If you're still listening at this point in the podcast, thank you so much. I don't know how your day has been to hear us at the end, but thank you for tuning in. Uh, you're listening means so much to us yeah if you listen to any part of this however short i'm happy with that it's a very long conversation if you're a pirates fan and you enjoyed all of this i'm glad you did we enjoyed this these movies so much so So much. much 
so much. So we had to get it all out there, you know? You had to we word had to... vomit our hearts out to yeah. fan out about these films. Yeah. Even like talking about it with you for as long as we have, I still feel like going and watching the movies again. <laughs> like I just saw them this week and did all of this research into the production, but I still want to see them again. I might l- load up Dead Man's Chest. I might load up at World's End. But yeah, this was a good time. Good conversation, Caroline. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. This was great. I- I'm looking forward to going and seeing it again. And I'm so glad that we were able to just fan out about this. But everybody yeah. out there, thank you again so much for listening. If you're still listening, even at the end, uh, I just want to remind everybody that if you're listening to us on YouTube, give a like, subscribe, hit the bell icon if you want. Um, leave a comment below. If you're listening to us on your favorite uh, podcast platform, then give us a good rating or give us an honest rating. Oh, there you and go. And give us a follow. That way you can hear some more of us in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys, for listening for any amount of time. Caroline, thank you for joining me in this conversation. It was an excellent one. And for now, we got to go. Bring me that horizon. Bring me that horizon.